Welcome to the Reptiles and Research Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Jonathan Howard, aka Beardy Vet. Now, I spent ages trying to get Beardy Vet on. When we first started this podcast, Beardy Vet was literally like target number one to have on as a guest. And it wasn't until like this year at the AHH conference, Beardy Vet actually asked us to come on the podcast so we managed to make this happen and let me tell you if you can see anything from how long this video is this interview or interrogation might (laughs) might i say is a behemoth of a piece of content this is bearded dragons in there totality i can't express how excited and proud of this video i am this is it. So people with bearded dragons who are itching to get bearded vet and have intricate little questions given to bearded vet, I grilled him. <laughs> we grilled him. So this is a really detailed video. So before we go into it though, we would like to thank our sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. Custom Reptile Habitats is keeping this podcast going so we can bring crazy things like guests like Dr. Jonathan Howard to this podcast and keep us operating. So if you want premium PVC enclosures, you can head on over to the link in the description below. If you want to help run the podcast and keep things as amazing and as good as this episode going and coming in the future, then you can head on over to Patreon slash Reptiles and Research. And then, other than that, let's get into today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. Could you please introduce yourself um, to the listeners who may not know who you are if they live under a rock, um, with a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Okay. Um, My name's Jonathan Howard, uh, Dr. Jonathan Howard. I'm a trained vet from Australia. And um, so I've been... Most people know me as uh, the beauty vet. Um, but to give a bit more background, um, I graduated in 2010, um, my veterinary studies, I went into mixed practice, then I went into surgery specialization, um, internship, and then I went exotics after that. So, um, I've always had an interest in exotics since I um, was young, and that was always going to be the path I was going to take. And, um... So after a few years, um, I decided to do a bit more research into bearded dragons, um, and I started a research project for bearded dragons, uh, looking at their blood values um, in wild bearded dragons. But um, yeah, so that's pretty much me. I completed that study. Um, Even though my project was specifically about blood values, I did pick up a lot of uh, data along the way, which uh, a lot of people showed a lot more interest in than uh, just the blood values. So, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, I am also an avid uh, actual animal uh, keeper, herp- uh, herpetological keeper. So I've had uh, kept lots of species of snakes and lizards, Australian species, um, and yeah, I've had them since I was a young boy. So, yeah. 30 years, so almost 30 years worth of reptile keeping um, experience. And uh, yeah, so I've got a nice broad based experience, but um, yeah, but that's me. Before you like chose to do something for Beard of Dragons, was, was this something that you felt that was like sorely needed? Um, and, and if you did, why? Was there any misconceptions that you felt like just needed investigating? Um, so Really, how the bearded dragon research came about was um, it, it happened in vet school. Um, you know, at vet, when I was going through vet school, uh, we didn't have Google Scholar. We had a journal database. We had the library um, at Sydney University. And I was looking for data on bearded dragons, um, but more specifically, blood values. Um, I started joining the, the unusual and exotic pets interest group for the veterinary field. And I realized that there wasn't much data around. We have normal bloods for dogs, horses, cattle, pigs, chickens, um, cats, but 
there is no data for bearded dragons um, at that point. So this was back in 2004. Uh, there was actually no data on many exotic rept uh, animals, reptiles at all, no normal values. Um, so I saw a need back then. I thought, yep, one day I'm going to go do it. Um, well, it, it actually happened. I had a, a sheep placement. So during vet school, you have to go out to a whole lot of farms. I chose a farm in the middle of Australia in the outback. Um, in the sole lane to see as many reptiles as I could. Um, I'll be honest, bearded dragons were not on my radar to go look at those reptiles because there were lots of other interesting reptiles. I had two bearded dragons. I kept at home. Everyone said, yeah, even 35 degrees. Um, and you know, they should be right. Just kept them the way I was told. They were rescues. Um, but then I drove out to this farm, this farm to give you an idea how far away it was. From Sydney, I had to drive 12 hours to get to Burke. And then from Burke, it's another 200 kilometers west from there. And it was all along dirt roads. So I started driving. And this was, I left at about eight in the morning. And then by the time it hit nine, we were starting, I was started to see bearded dragons. Like, just heaps of them sitting on the sides of the road. After about another 30 minutes, I probably counted well over about 30 bearded dragons mm -hmm. sitting all on the edges of the road. And I'm like, oh, well, when you do normal blood values for bearded, for animal, for any animal, humans, elephants, whatever, you need numbers. You need lots and lots of numbers. And I saw these bearded dragons and I was like, no one's done a study on the normal blood values of these guys. I'm going to do this. And that was 2005, 2006. And so that's where it really came from. Okay, I want to do this study. I want to do this study. And it wasn't until 2017 that I go, okay, I've got the opportunity to do this study. Um, I'd set up a few things with my work um, where I could go, okay, I really want to do this study now. I know where to find them. Um, so I had a quick look at the literature. In the meantime, I've been working as a, um exotic vet. And you look at the reference values, which they would give you. And it was always, it, it was from nowhere. Like literally, I think there was two studies done. Um, no, one study done. And it was all on captive animals in Japan. And... It was a lot of numbers, but even the reference lab did not reference those values. That's how they went. So um, I think they got it from like a small study of like 21 dragons or something, something really small, the reference lab. So at that point, I went, you know what? I was being in clinical practice. I had seen what happens in the clinic, the animals coming in, they're all sick from husbandry. And everyone has wrong husbandry. There was no one there that you could say, you know, it was good husbandry, the lighting. So I'll, I put, I said, if we get reference values from animals in captivity, it's not going to be the right values that we have. Um, there are concerns when you take wild animals compared to captive animals, like food supply and stuff like that. And that might affect some of the blood levels, but, um, there was nothing on wild bearded dragons, no bloods, no diseases, nothing really specific for them. So that's where I said, okay, let's do this. One, it was the, it's the most popular lizard pet in Australia, but possibly the world. So I knew that it would be really valuable to have that data set. And at that point in time, my mind was, let's help the veterinary profession. So they've got numbers to work with, and then we can help the owners that come in. So that's where it really came about, where I, I want to do this study um, to, to fill, fill gaps, really, fill gaps for the veterinary professionals and to help people with their animals. So. Uh, how big a range did you cover with the beard dragons? Um, so... 
week that covered uh, about. So my study site was um, in, it was limited to New South Wales, which is a state, typically because my research license only covered that state. Um, so I had to, actually, I'll just pull up a map so you'd, you'd be able to, um, I'll be able to show you. So um, this is the natural, natural range. So this is New South Wales. This is Sydney, where I started. And Burke starts about here. So I covered this whole area here, which is about an eighth of their range. But to give you an idea, the size of that area, that's 118,000 square kilometres, which is for those working in Imperial, that's 45,000 square miles, about the size of Pennsylvania State in the US, or in Europe, it's the size of Austria and Switzerland combined. That's the range that we have to do. Even though we took such an, an eighth of their natural range, um, it is still, we're talking several hundred kilometers across. Um, so we, we, when you're doing a study, you have to do it over a long period. So we did it over three years. Um, and you also have to put, for getting these species, you have to cover a large range as well. So the data is not skewed. So, um, so yeah, so it's, that's the range that we covered. And, um, it was a lot of driving. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but that was what was needed because I realized I'd probably only get to do this once and to do it properly. I didn't, I didn't want to, um, have it just skewed in any way. I wanted the data to be a hundred percent so we could go with confidence. These is what the normal phase of, um, bearded dragons are for the blood ranges. So. Yeah, so anyone that's like, oh, yeah, but like just looking at the wild ones is representative of like the entire population. In terms of space you've covered and the amount you've looked at, it's very, very representative of Bearded Dragons, probably. Yeah, it's, I would say it is. Um, I have found Bearded Dragons in South Australia and they tend to be a bit smaller, just like in Phenotype. Um, and then I've also covered ones. So a lot of people, they are, yeah, bearded dragons live in an arid area. I've covered ones. I've actually driven up to the Barclay Highway, um, up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, which the one we caught there, the humidity was about 92% during the day there. Wow. So, um, you know, bearded dragons are very, um, adaptable. Um, the biggest thing for their survivability out there is the amount of heat and that area that they're distributed in um it gets quite hot from the air moving across the dry um and hot arid interior but also the heat coming down from the north so um from from um Badham, she did a thesis studying bearded dragons separating uh pagona viticeps from pagona barbata uh, the coastal bearded dragon because they were considered um the same species just different subspecies but she concluded that the biggest reason for um, separation and the difference and what central bearded dragons need is actually um, the, the heat in the springtime. It needs to be hot enough for them to commence breeding. And that's what's made it so they can continue to breed and only in that area. Too far east in the springtime, the heat is not hot enough for them to one produce enough, but also um, um, just continue on the uh, life cycle. So. so that's what separated them. Then, so they've basically developed into separate niches of like the hotter and cooler elements. Then, there. Yep, hotter that's and cooler. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, there's that. That's definitely what's separated them. And we will maybe talk about it later when uh, if we talk about heating and stuff like that. But uh, for them, they're obviously basking a lot of the time. Right. Okay, cool. So I think the good place to start with bearded dragons is obviously uh, thermoregulation. So bearded dragons are renowned for their propensity to bask. So I thought it would be really apt to start with how they thermoregulate in the wild. Could you 
you've described the time that you commonly find them basking as like beardy hour. Could you go into that a little bit for us? Yeah. So, um, so as you know, so bearded dragons, they're a basking species, what we call a heliothermic species. Um, so they need to bask, get their temperatures up to the preferred optimal body temperature so they can digest food, um, all the metabolism and everything like that. So where we actually find them, so it's an arid area, the nights can get quite cold and it's only really just in the peak of summer where the nighttime temperatures are still quite warm. Um, for example, in spring, it's early spring breeding season. Days will be getting anywhere between 27 and 30 degrees and that's when they really start coming out. Uh, but the night times are still five degrees. So it still gets quite cold for them. So when we go out, we'd usually drive along the roads and it's not until about, depending, 9.30 is when they start coming out to bath. Um, and that's their first bath. It's What actually happens is, is they've slowly warmed up as the air temperatures increased and once they've warmed up they'll move to actively basking in the sun but hidden and then once their body temperatures hit over about 26 degrees they'll actually go to a basking open exposed basking position and um actually if i show you a graph of all the basking temperatures of the dragons that we found um we can actually see what how this how this looks okay so we actually got even though this is can you see that graph on your screen yep so even though this looks like a whole scattering of uh temperatures with no real basking time but you can see the basking time from about nine o'clock it started there but this is all seasons that we found them so depending on whether in the warmer months, they came out earlier, and in uh, the cooler months, so late, uh, early spring or late autumn, they actually came out later as the air temperatures came up. They'd come out, and we'd have about a window of about an hour in the warmer months to about two hours uh, in the, the cooler months. And that's the time at which they would bask to get their body temperatures up to their preferred optimal body temperature. And they would bask for that period and once they got up to the right temperature they would either go off and hunt for food or if especially in springtime um the males would actually move to an area that wasn't uh didn't have as much sun or they would position their body to reduce the amount of sun on their body to prevent overheating because once it got to the middle of the day depending on what season the temperature air temperature got to the point where they didn't need to keep basking to keep their body temperatures high and but also at the same time they wouldn't want to have their body at a high temperature a preferred optimal body temperature um for the whole day because they want to conserve the higher the temperature the more metabolism they're chewing energy so they would actually go to a sheltered position um a shaded position and once the afternoon temperatures um started to drop again or have eaten some food during the middle parts of the day that actually come out again in the afternoon to bask again get an extra bit of heat continue digestion but also to keep some warmth throughout the night so do you think that they generally prefer cooler air temperatures than we give them credit for because i've noticed my bit of dragon she 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 comes and goes out of vivarium and she seeks cooler temperatures um than i would expect a lot of the time she'll go find some really cool in the corner sort of like like low low 20 22 sort of thing and go like camp out and just sit there she won't go to sleep so it's not like she's gone over somewhere and like got cold and then fell asleep she's just sitting somewhere cooler so when we have like our cool ends at like a minimum of like 30 degrees and things like that do you think they generally prefer quite cooler air temperatures yeah so we have to think of reptiles um especially this type of reptile it lives in an arid zone it's got limited food supply limited water supply these animals they want to get to a preferred optimal body temperature to kick start their metabolism for the day so 
so that they're quick, they can escape predators, they can eat, um, they can digest. But if they don't have any food or there's no need to keep their body temperature high, they're going to move to an area that's cooler um, just because it's saving energy. Um, a lot of bearded dragons, they've come from an environment and there's two methods which reptiles will adapt to an arid environment. So there's behavioral. So they'll deal with the desert heat by hiding during the day. So some of your geckos and stuff like that um, in arid areas have adapted that way. And they'll, they'll hide during the hottest part of the day, but also during the heat of the day. Um, and a lot of the arid snakes as well, they'll actually do that. And then you've got other species which go, okay, I'm going to adjust my body temperature. So they have higher preferred optimal body temperatures to operate at. And they'll adapt that way. They'll evolve that way. So they can last for longer hours out there, but that requires a lot more food. So bearded dragons have... Central bearded dragons have adapted a bit of both in this situation. Their preferred optimal body temperature is over a degree higher than your coastal bearded dragons. So they've adapted that way. Um, but also when they're out there, we have them basking, but retreating in the hottest part of the day. We do have species of lizards, uh, Tenophorus nucullus, um, the central netted dragon and your Tympanocryptus species, which will be out there when it's 45 degrees, 50 degrees. Their metabolism is so high, um, but they require a lot of food. So bearded dragons has hit the middle. So for them, they'll use the heat, but then they retreat during the, the middle part of the day and try to cool their bodies down to a certain level, preserve, because they don't have endless amounts of food um, and, and they're not an annual species. A lot of the species that have adapted to have the really high preferred optimal body temperatures in Australia are, are, are annual species, which will live and die within the same season. So um, it's bearded dragons. We They don't want to be at that high temperature the whole time. Um, and their instinct in them tells them to, okay, stay cool unless I eat then I need to increase my body temperature. I need to reproduce, increase my body temperature. So we do see dragons, like in clinical practice, a lot of keepers who keep their dragons hot the whole time, even the nighttime temperatures, the dragon will want to hide. It won't want to come out and bask in the morning because it's chewing up so much of its reserves, its instinct tells it to stay down, stay out of the heat because you're already chewing all that energy. So a lot of animals um, in captivity, you see them, they shouldn't be basking. In captivity, they should not be sitting underneath the basking lamp all day if you have the right temperature. They should come out first thing in the morning, bask, and then after an hour, once they've warmed up, they can retreat somewhere else where it's a couple of these degrees cooler um, and then if they eat, they might eat and then come to bars. But it's a common thing in captivity, people thinking, oh, why isn't my dragon basking all the time? Stuff like that. Your dragon should only really be basking for a short period of time. And depending on the nighttime temperature, if you have warm nighttime temperatures, it will bask less because it doesn't need to raise. Like, as I was saying, in the springtime, the air temperatures are five degrees at night. Yeah, they're in burrows during that part of the year. Um, and so they'll get down to, you know, 11, 12 degrees. Um, they'll actually get most of the time get colder than their winter um, hibernation burrows, but they'll get quite cold. And that's why they come out um, in the springtime and they bask for so long because they've got to raise their temperatures from about 10 degrees to all the way up to. 36.3, which is what we found the core body temperature of them to be. So, but in the summertime, nighttime temperatures, 27 degrees, 
they need to bask for, you know, 10, 20 minutes and then the temperatures are up and then they can go off and do what they want or they can go sit in the shade and survey their territory and um, look out for food and stuff like that. So yeah. It's funny you mentioned 27 because that's literally the number that this room has been hitting some uh, some nights and she, she really, really basks. Um, early in the morning she'll bask and then the rest of the day she'll just chill out. And it's basically yeah. exactly what you describe, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, that it's it's something that we just need to be aware of. Like, yeah, it's okay to let them have a nighttime drop as long as you have the daytime temperatures appropriate. Um, and that's not just a problem that people have with bearded dragons. I see it in people with pet snakes, people keeping snakes in racks. They keep them in a very narrow window of 28 degrees and 32 degrees. And they don't hit their preferred optimal body temperature, but they also, um, they don't get cold enough. So, and that's okay. People keep them successfully in that narrow band because the temperature that they're at and they get down to never stresses them. But if their temperature starts going down to 20 degrees at night and you only have 32 degree basking spot that's when it all falls apart an immune system that's been operating uh subclinically sick gets tipped over the edge so um you know it's i think this there's a mentality within the reptile keeping community that all these animals we can't let them get their nighttime temperatures low but when you look at some of them in the wild they will get down to 10 12 degrees celsius the amount of heat in the sun during the day is enough to get them so their immune systems, which is on metabolically, they get switch on so they can deal with that. And that's the proper way which they've evolved to survive and live, not in a narrow set of range, which, you know, it doesn't, yeah, sure, in the wild, they don't have the extremes because they can move and have that choice. But in our terrariums, some people stick them in this narrow range and that's it's not allowing them to go okay i need to switch my body off because that's what i've evolved to do and then during the day switch it back on i think that makes a lot of sense so in the past you have described female bearded dragons like emerging after sunset and i think a lot of people would be surprised by that why is it they emerge after sunset so it's mate it's it's really only in the breeding season so when we talk about, you know, the bearded dragons that are coming out to bask in the morning, then the males will generally go bask at a high point that's shaded, um, not use it, as little energy as possible and survey the area. The females will often go off and feed if they can and then bask some more during the day. But then in the afternoon, when the temperatures come back down, as we're getting towards dusk, temperatures start dropping. The radiant heat decreases. Obviously, the sun's going down. And out in where they are, um, termites is a major protein for them, animal protein for them. Um, and the females will actually eat uh, in the afternoon large amounts of termites. And then to digest that, for breeding, for incubating eggs, they'll go back out onto the roads um, and they'll come out. And we see them on the roads. So this is usually around 6, 7 p.m. Um, after the sun has actually gone down and there's actually no radiant heat at all. Um, they'll be on the roads basking. They'll be on the sides of the roads or a surface that's warm. Um, and when we first started taking temperatures of these animals, um, we were taking temperatures on the top of them and it's like 23, 24 degrees. But then when you flip them and you measure the, bas the, the belly temperature, it's up around 36 degrees. So they're absorbing quite a lot of heat from their, their bellies. So, um, and that's why we see a lot of the females coming out after dusk um, to do that. Because at that time of year, um, as I said before, central bearded dragons, how they differentiated themselves, they needed the heat in spring to be able to reproduce. And that's what they're doing. They're grabbing as much heat as they can because 
they're a boom or bust species. They're an arid species. If times are good, there's heat available, let's breed it, and food available, let's breed as much as we can. So they're obviously using th- thigmothermy as well as heliothermy in the wild as well, then? Yeah. So in the wild, they're definitely using thigmothermy. Um, the thing is, is like we don't see males doing that at all. They don't need it. Um, and, you know, as much as, but just showing you how less effective it is than the radiant heat is that when we were taking temperatures of them, the temperatures on their backs and the rest of their body was so much lower than the temperature on their belly. So even though they are using thigmothermy and a lot of the species in Australia that do use thigmothermy um, that we see is it's during the hottest part of the year, the hot nights and stuff like that. There is no way an animal, um, most of them would be able to get enough heat. There's just too much bulk to them to get thigmothermy on a road um, after dusk. It's always during the hottest parts of the year that they'll just get that extra bit to keep going. And we see that in a lot of other species in Australia, like diamond pythons, for example. Um, you see them in the winter time; they'll actually become diurnal using radiant heat. But in the winter time, uh, in the summertime, they go nocturnal and they can use the heat off the road because the nighttime air temperatures are so high. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not, they do do it, but they're, it's not as effective for them as, uh, heliothermy, as in basking. So, yeah. Um, do they use their bellies to cool down as well? So, um, we saw it in, Two cases, um, and it's also documented in uh, the Batam paper that they'll actually use their bellies to cool down. Um, so when we talk about basking, so basking or being exposed is not just for thermoregulation, not just for heating themselves up. Um, it's to obviously be out exposed, so especially in beta dragons, so another male, especially the males can see them, um, they can survey, they can have a vantage point for getting to food and stuff like that. So when they're exposed, especially in spring, when the temperatures start getting really high, um, so we, we did witness one dragon that we must have just missed its combat point, but they were exposed combating in the full sun. And we saw one of the males go off and he just went into a cool area underneath a shaded area and just lay flat out on the cold sand. So in the springtime, in the sun, the sand exposed by about 11 a.m., it will be, you know, 40 degrees on the sand, 50 degrees. But if it's been shaded, that sand still has a lot of thermal mass and it'll be 25, 24 degrees in that cooler area or even colder if the night's been really cold. So they do use that to cool themselves down, pull some heat out of them. So, yeah, so. It just goes to show how thermally diverse their environment is and how like diverse their thermoregulation behavior is, not just like bask or not sort of thing. Yeah. And there's, and that's the thing, like when we, when we look at their, um, their environment, it's, when we put them in a box, we kind of limit what's available to them. And this is one of, I guess that's one of one of the things with um, reptile keeping is that you've got to try and get their whole environment and their what they have available, all their little microclimates, and you have to try and fit it into a box for them. Um, when we look at them in the wild, they can go from the shade of a tree where the air temperature is 24 degrees, the ground that they're on can be 18, 19 degrees, but then they can shift 10 centimetres to the right and that's full sun and the ground's already 50 degrees there. So they have all this stuff available and that's what we've got to try and, I guess, to somewhat mimic in a terrarium. We don't need it 50 degrees because we know they're not going to use that 50 degrees, 
but we do need to have that temperature of a uh, higher temperatures available so they can get that heat but also if they don't want it they can go somewhere else so um, it's about giving them options and without stressing them at the extremes as well but, which they would never choose in the world I think you've already touched on it. You've basically just described it, but I wanted to go over the term biphasic basking. Could you just uh, like define it a little bit for the viewers for us? So biphasic, so bi means two and phasic is phases, two phase basking. So what we see is they come out in the morning for a few hours to bask and then they retreat during the hottest part of the day once they've got up to temperature and then once the temperatures drop again in the afternoon or they've been feeding, they'll come back again and bask until um, late in the afternoon where the temperature gets cool enough where they'll retreat to burrows um, or they'll retreat to um, their nighttime resting place. So even though they have burrows, a lot of the time, especially during the warmer parts of the year, they'll actually sleep on bushes, logs, sleep in a tree type thing rather than sleeping in the burrows. They generally just use the burrows for the earliest parts of um, spring where the nighttime's still cold or the latest part of autumn. So obviously they're basking, they're using like really hot basking spots. How does basking play a role in like parasite management in the wild? So, as generally, reptiles, we know they're cold blooded ectothermic animals. They rely on the sun or the, the result of the sun heating up the environment to, for their metabolism. So, we see them, uh, a dragon, when it gets its body up to a preferred optimal body temperature, that's when everything is firing its metabolism is at its peak digestion would be at its peak um, everything is working as it's evolved and having those temperatures at, so it can get high enough to get its metabolism up that means its immune systems at a hundred percent a problem that we have in captivity is we have people not keeping the basking spots hot enough. And when, and this is amongst all reptiles, when the amount of heat available for the reptile is not hot enough, then their immune system drops. And that gives the parasites an opportunity to take over. Pathology, disease, relies on three factors. It's the host, the environment, and the pathogen. Um, interaction. So if we have a host super strong, then it's got its best chance. It's environment. So in a bearded dragon, so it's getting enough food, it's getting its right temperatures and everything like that. And then you've got your pathogen. So, um, you know, whether it's worms, um, or for example, a recent example, if we, Talk about humans, COVID, stuff like that. And it depends on how pathogenic that pathogen is, how easily it can make them sick. So, and that's a balance that every animal exists and human exists in that state. And if you affect any of that to a certain point, the chance of disease comes upon it. So, um, having an animal that's not basking at its preferred optimal body temperature, its immune system is not working properly. And then that gives the opportunity for if something in the environment goes wrong, it's too wet or it's all the pathogen. So the worm can then go, okay, the parasite can go, okay, immune system's down. I have an advantage here to reproduce and take over and take advantage. So um, that's how the basking temperatures uh, affect parasite control, but also we're finding with a lot of, especially Australian reptiles, don't particularly call, we don't, they don't, when they brewmate, they don't totally switch off. They still come out during the winter 
um, to bask if it's warm enough. And we actually do see this in bearded dragons as well. If the daytime temperatures are around 27 degrees in the winter, they'll still come out and bask. And that is the animal coming on, switching on its metabolism, switching on its immune system just to help keep things in check, keeping its immune system up. Um, and that's what we see in a lot of the species um, in Australia, even in the winter, even some of the snakes coming out during the winter still basking, trying to get their bodies warm enough so they can control parasites um, that go on. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we you we went into a little bit of like, you've got a lot of surface temperature data for what they've basked in in the wild. Based upon everything that you've experienced, what would you recommend as a surface temperature for a basking spot in captivity? So this is, this is a really hard thing to answer because on... Doing it, we realized that um, I'll get it up. Just share my screen. Oh, here we go. That's some females sitting after dusk on the road, on the sides of the road, basking. And that's for the bellies. That's for the belly heat. So it's it does happen, and that's a nice good image of what, what they're doing there. But so this is the substrate temperature. And most of the time here, we're seeing a lot of the temperatures around between the 30 and 40. Then we've got quite a few temperatures above. And then the hottest one, um, this was 65 degrees on a big male in springtime on the middle of the road. We don't know what he was doing on the middle of the road. We just came across him. We suspect he was not actually thermoregulating. Um, he was actually displaying to another male. That's what we think is going on there. Um, but the problem, even though we got a lot of substrate surface, it's all different surfaces. It's wood, um, it's sand, bitumen, if we got them on a bit of bitumen road, um, or some of them we got off the tops of bushes or fence posts as well. So the problem with so many varied substrates is that they all have different thermal masses. So, for example, we got to an area. Um, there was an area that we'd go. There was a ridge um, that we used to go and find. When I say a ridge, it's in the desert, so it's just a little hill, and they had these big... Um, kind of marble rocks sitting there and every dragon that we took off them um, the temperatures were still around 20 degrees even though it was in the afternoon because they just had so much thermal mass but the dragons that were sitting on them were 10 15 degrees higher and i don't i'm not convinced that this is the best way to determine the temperature of a basking site if you because i could say yeah it's best to be at 42 but it depends whether it's slate or it depends whether it's a piece of wood um so um there are different ways to measure it um what we can get from it though when pairing it with the bearded dragon temperatures where we actually took the temperature off the back of the bearded dragon is that these bearded dragons can have a lot better at absorbing radiant heat than the um, surface around them. They do it a lot more rapidly um, and, you know, providing around on a rock, if you've got peak temperatures around 42 degrees, that bearded dragon could definitely get to its preferred optimal body temperature. I would more likely say to an owner is to measure when your bearded dragon is basking and measure with a laser thermometer the surface of the bearded dragon's back and get it so it is definitely getting up to about 38 or 40 degrees. Um, we found that they're off, 
So their preferred optimal body temperature, their core body temperature is 36.3. That's what our study found. And that's what Badham's study found, which was over 50 years ago. They found the exact same temperature. And the reason why we want to have higher temperatures, and this is all reptiles, if you have an animal that has a preferred optimal body temperature, you need to have a basking source that will provide heat warmer than that because it's got to go through the animal. The animal, it's, you know, it has to be gaining heat faster than it's losing it out the other bits out of its belly and stuff like that. And this is a principle that, that I see in clinical practice where people go, Oh, but they only like to be 29, 30 degrees. And it's like, yeah, but when you have an animal that's this big and you only have, it wants its whole body to be 29 or 30 degrees and you provide it 30 degrees, it's never going to get to 30 degrees inside its body. So that's why it's important, even though their preferred optimal body temperature is 36.3, you need to have the, the basking amount of basking energy and basking temperatures for their skin to get several degrees higher so their core body temperature can get to that preferred optimal body temperature. So, Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, question, do we dare go into power density? <laughs> power density. This is... So I guess for those people that don't know what we're talking about, power density is the amount of energy in the sun's rays. That's UV rays, visible light rays, and infrared rays. Um, and it's been something that is talked about quite recently on the um, Advancing Herpetological Husbandry page and the Reptile Louding page. And this answers our what temperature should our substrate be at how much wattage should the lamp be at this is something that when i looked at okay we're going to measure the bar the basking spot temperature of the beta dragons and it just didn't line up you know because there were so many different surfaces we needed something where it didn't rely on the object being heated that we could uniformly say this is how much we need um I did not, my study was before we even, before um, this concept of power density use even came up. So I don't even actually have power density reading for these animals. Um, but I'm using it now and I, I can't, honestly, I cannot give you a range of what power density should be at. Um, for example, I got behind me, I got my, um, I got a chameleon and its power density, um, underneath a halogen lamp, the UV lamp and, uh, LED, um, visible light, spotlight is power density is at 400 watts per square meter. And I stick my hand underneath that or my forearm, and I can honestly say it's nowhere near what the burning sensation when I'm catching those bearded dragons out in the wild that are basking. So we need to, yeah, it'd be good to get some readings, um, but then we also need to look at what do they actually need to get that body temperature up to the correct point, because there's, in this day and age, you don't want to be pumping excess energy if it's not needed in there and it is somewhat determined as i said before season how low the nighttime temperature gets if it's a lower nighttime temperature for them to get up to a adequate preferred optimal body temperature is going to take a lot more power than if they're at higher overnight temperatures and to raise it um fewer degrees so at this stage Power density is not something that um, I, I can confidently recommend um, at the moment. I can recommend skin surface temperatures with a laser thermometer off the back of a bearded dragon, which I would say is 40 to 42 degrees. Because I would feel comfortable in your captive setting if you kept them 
in a basement where nighttime temperatures were 12 degrees um, and then during the day you wanted to heat them, you'd want that bearded dragon's skin temperature to be getting up around 42 to 45 degrees if it was that cold. Yeah, power densities are very new thing. So for beginners watching, they're like, what? Don't worry. It's, it's, it's the sort of thing that like the next five to ten years is going to be a mainstream thing. It, but for now, it'll it's come. like, yeah. yeah. It'll definitely come. And I think it's, you know, in the last five years, people just started to get their head around UV index. So, um, you know, so we're about to, we've, once we've got that under control, power density, and I think, I, I know it's going to be the way to to go forward and say this is how much energy we need, um, rather than going oh yeah just stick an ominous lamp and measure that piece of wood piece of whatever that's sitting underneath it or air temperatures. Yeah, yeah the future of Basque and spots coming, but we're not yeah. there yet. So for now, um, like you say, the skin surface temperature using a laser thermometer on the back of the bit of dragon. So let's move into UV now that we've gone really deep on thermoregulation so uv why is it important okay so um uv ultraviolet um so the, the main one that's got attention um especially in reptiles that we've known of is uh uvb uh which is i'll i'll bring up a graph um and i'll be honest i stole it from um I think Francis Baines, Dr. Francis Baines, the uh, world's expert in reptile UV. Uh, so this is a um, an image that Dr. Francis Baines put together. And I feel that this is pretty much when we're talking in the context of bearded dragons, you can't get a better diagram than this. It's got the bearded dragon there. Um, so UV is a wavelength of light that it rea reacts in the skin with cholesterol um, to, to form uh, pre-vitamin D3. And then the warmth from the basking light or the sun converts it to vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is really important because um, it tells the body to... Um, it gives them the substrate for it to pull calcium from the intestines, but it also has a lot of regulation effects on the other parts of the body. So the main thing we see in clinical practice, the effect of, so remember a veterinarian sees when an animal is not healthy, so it's got to the point where it's gone from surviving to not surviving, um, is we see a lot of bone disease. So there's not enough vitamin D for it to tell the um, body to start pulling in calcium and uh, laying down, telling it to lay down bone or mobilize bone, um, the calcium in the bone. So that's what UVB is important for. And um, I'm not quite sure whether I've explained it as well as I could have, but, um, at the basics of it, it's essential. Vitamin D is essential for bone metabolism. And that's why we have problems. Uh, you have problems in reptiles like rubber jaw when um, there's a lack of vitamin D3 or vitamin D. And the primary way in which bearded dragons get vitamin D3 is through exposure to UV light and, importantly, being at the right preferred optimal body temperature. They need the warmth in the skin to get it from the pre-vitamin D3 to the vitamin D3. So those two are very important and it's often been people think, oh yeah, I've given it UV, B, whether it was the right amount, but without the proper basking temperature, you are not optimizing this process. So um yeah so that's that's why it's important and several uh a study by unix et al um he studied juvenile bearded dragons and he put them under uvb light and bearded dragons that were exposed to uv um had a lot higher vitamin d, blood vitamin d3 levels than 
um, animals without vitamin, uh, without UVB, but also he overdosed the animals, giving them uh, some animals that had no UV were given up to four times the amount of recommended daily vitamin D3 requirement. And those animals could not absorb that vitamin D3 in the diet. So we know that bearded dragons cannot absorb vitamin D3 through the diet um, like people, like humans. So um, therefore, the only way and the proper way to keep a bearded dragon for it to ensure that it has enough vitamin D is exposing it to appropriate levels of UVB along with the appropriate um, basking temperature. So when people, I've seen some people say before where, but oh yeah, if you get enough oral D3, you just keep hot enough, like UVB is a scam. So that's certainly not the case. No. So we know from a scientific study where they went from, gave it the days, the amount that are required to twice the amount required to four times the amount that a bearded dragon requires. And there was no significant increase of vitamin D3 in their blood. So we know they can't. And I also know that the main cause of that is that vitamin D is a fat soluble um, vitamin. The problem is it cannot be absorbed across, passively absorbed across the intestine. It's not in a form that can be passively. So just put it in there and it's not just going to cross the intestinal barrier. It requires the bile acids, which is from its liver, to go in there and break up those vitamins, those fat molecules into a small, what we call a micelle. And it, and then the intestines can go through and pull it into the bloodstream from there. So they lack that, those bile acids to actually um, absorb the vitamin D3. And there's pretty much in terms of giving them straight vitamin D, there is no way to get it across there. Um, doesn't matter. You can pump as much as you want in there and, well, four times the amount they need and they're still not going to absorb it. So, um, so UVB is pretty much the only way to, to get it in there. And, you know, some animals, some people go through, say, oh, never given it to their animals. And, you know, that's not a really, we, we know that these animals aren't going to be at optimal levels. So. Yeah. so obviously you were measuring UVIs in the wild. Um, what did you find that they were basking at UVI wise in the wild? And then based upon that, what would you recommend in captivity? So um, I'll actually show you another graph. So this is the UV index. So for those listening that don't know what we're talking about when we say the UV index, so the UV index was a standard made um, to measure the amount, well, it was to put a value on the amount of uh, sunburn um, activity of the sun. And it actually closely correlates to the vitamin D production in the skin so reptile keepers have adopted this to this uvi um, unit ultraviolet index unit to tell us the vitamin d producing power of a light that we're giving a uv light we're giving to a reptile or we can go out and say well this is how much you know at uvi 2 it's half as strong as UVI-4. So um, it's very useful. We're very lucky that it can be used to tell us how well, uh, how the potential of a, of a UV producing lamp is. But what, so what I did is, um, for, I got my hands on a UV index meter, the solar meter um, 6.5, and I actually measured the UV index of every bearded dragon that we caught while I had this index meter. Um, in the end, I think it was about 112 data points on these dragons. So it's not a small number. And 
if you look at this graph, um, I haven't split it. This is over our whole three years. And if you look at the curve, it's time of day on the bottom and UV index on the vertical axis there, uh, the axis there. So it pretty much follows the normal daily um, peak and drop of um, the sun. So obviously the sun's producing the UV. And what we found is, so even though there's dragons, they've got, you know, they were out and most of these dragons up here were out at greater than 10, some of these ones at the top. Um, and then if we look down to the right, right at the bottom, um, this is after dusk. Um, so, you know, UV index was close to zero. But if we look at all the data points and we averaged it out, um, we actually can correlate. So if you do um, the statistics on it, when you get all the animals and average it out, uh, we got an average of about 4.1. So this is what the average dragon would need um, to produce appropriate levels of vitamin D for them to be exposed at a UV index of 4.1. Um, if we look at, as I said before, we had gravid females. They were out basking after dusk, dusk. So the data is skewed there to go towards, you know, a lower UV index. Um, but on average, our animals are, uh, were using 4.1 as a UV index. And this is something that we can use inside the enclosure where the basking spot is um, because at, we know at 4.1, uh, UV index of 4.1, the average dragon is producing um, the same as it would as if it's out in the wild. It would be exposing itself on average to a UV index of 4.1 while basking. So that's how we can correlate and, and adapt it to our um, husbandry and captive care is providing them with that 4.1. We, and we have, I have no doubt at that UV index that they could produce an adequate level of vitamin D for them to thrive into a captivity. So based upon that then, what technology would you recommend keepers use? And then how would you place that in the enclosure in terms of where it's placed? So if you had the funds, I would get a UV index meter, a solar meter 6.5. Um, that's the one that we use. That's the one that's had the most research done with it. That's the one that's been tested the most. Um, and we can say that you could get one of those. If you're a keeper who has several animals and several lamps and you want to be able to, to monitor them for the, the best amount of time, um, you, you, I would suggest in purchasing a solar meter 6.5. Um, if you are a keeper who um, has one bearded dragon, um, I would say either get your lamp tested by a vet, a reptile vet, if they have a 6.5, because it, it just wouldn't be kind of like a cost benefit analysis just wouldn't be there. I would highly recommend you buy a reputable uh, UVB fluorescent lamp, um, which would be, you know, there's the Reptosun uh, lamps or the Arcadia lamps, um, which have been tested by lots of keepers with solar meters and their amount of UV um, emitted from those lamps has been tested and at certain distances and go off those recommended distances and replace your lamp at the recommended interval um, if you didn't want to buy one of these solar meter 6.5s or where it just didn't it's not enough value for you so you know you're only keeping one bearded dragon just change the lamp as Arcadia or Reptor Sun recommends and that's every 12 months and have the basking spot where your dragon's back would be 
um, under where the basking lamp is, where the UV overlaps with it, have that hitting at between about 3.8 and 4.5. So back in the day, obviously people used to have like UV the entire length of the vivarium. What would you recommend nowadays? So there's several ways you can do it. Um, my recommended way is to have your UVB lamp so it covers the whole animal. Um, and that way, and the basking, obviously the basking lamp, it overlaps with the basking lamp. So it gets the warmth and the UV over its whole body. Um, if you had a focused type UVB where the UV would be 6.5 in the middle and then petering out to you know, zero at the edges of the animal. It just makes it really hard to go, okay, how much is this animal actually getting? When these bearded dragons were basking during the day, when they come out to bask, they just expose their whole body. So let's just replicate the sun, have it so it's covering the whole body while it basks. It gets the right temperature. It gets its appropriate amount of UVB. That's the best way to do it. Um, those that have giant enclosures um yeah once again have it everywhere where you have a basking spot have the uv at the appropriate level so you really recommend like a long linear like t5 so it covers the, the entire animal in a flood and not like the coils for an animal no, so the, the co coils are notorious for producing a very focused beam um you've got mercury vapor bulbs um and your metal halides and they focus they have a focus beam in the middle um and it's it's just really hard to get you know and an even spread on there like where do you measure the uv from from the center or the outside or halfway it's just hard to get an idea and honestly it's it's not i've measured in the wild and <laughs> these dragons that are basking for the beardy hour that they're, they're not you know they're not sitting in 6.5 in the middle of their head and then zero down the back of their tail or anything it's it's right across their body so um that's the easiest way to do it um and the most reliable way yeah a, definitely a, a t5 for a, a bearded dragon size animal if you've got a gecko or some small lizard then you're yeah, sure having a having a, a coil lamp would suffice because it would cover the whole animal and be relatively um, linear over a small area like the same but for a bearded dragon that's you know two foot long 60 centimeters long it's you need a nice broad spread even spread so, so let's uh go into visible light and obviously we know bearded dragons have the pariah to lie and that kind of acts as like a light dosimeter at the top of the head. How important is brightness at the basking spot to them? Um, so these guys are highly visual animals. Um, having a high amount of visible light paired with the basking spot is important. That's the animals evolve to go where the bright light is. That's where its UV is. Um, you know, they can see in UVA. Um, so having that UVA, UVB lamp over the basking spot, that's the place you're, that animal's learning. It, it knows. It doesn't learn. It, it knows. It's born with that instinct to go where that bright light is. Um, we've had, I had a lot of, a lot of keepers come in, um, with problems using ceramic heat lamps, um, and having, I'm not quite sure the way some makers design enclosures, but they have the UV light at one end and then the basking lamp at the other end. And it just confuses the hell out. Like they don't come separately in the wild. They come at the same spot. So having that bright light, um, visible light at with the basking area, that's really important. Uh, but also the overall light levels is important as well um they come from a very bright environment so having a large amount of light is good for them do we need to get it to wild amounts of light it's super bright out there <laughs> in the middle of the australian desert um actually one of the differences well every most animals um 
than the eye, the human eye. We, we have a pupil, so we can strip down in bright light. So, you know, it's there are mechanisms for an animal to, to restrict the amount of light. So we don't need to go to maximum levels. Uh, but also, we do know if we look at the morphological differences between the eastern bearded dragon and the central bearded dragon, the central bearded dragon actually has a, a well-developed brow above their eyes, which acts like a cap. So they've actually evolved to try and reduce the amount of brightness coming into them as well. But at the same time, they do come from a very bright environment and having a bright light there, you know, I don't think enough studies have been done um, with parieto eye and the pineal gland in especially in like for what we're interested in as reptile keepers, as in thermoregulation, um, but also cueing all the processes of life, reproduction, rumination, um, all that stuff. Um, it would be interesting, but to, to see studies on that, but unfortunately no one's, no one studies has done any of those studies. But we see problems in captivity very much with, um, you know, animals breeding out of season, breeding for extended amounts of time, brumating, not brumating, you know, I think, yeah, we could go to studies, but for now, while we don't have studies, the thing is to let's mimic what they get out there within, you know, using some common sense, you know, don't, yeah, sure, it gets... 45 degrees and 65 degrees on the ground out there. We don't need that. We can <laughs> don't have to go to that extreme, but providing as much as we can because they have evolved to what the environment has given them and they've chosen their microclimate. If we can provide them with that and then somehow getting it into our box at home, that's the best way to go about it without relying on studies which you know haven't been done yet or what will hopefully one day get done but you know it's going to be a while and, and done properly so. speaking of um topics where there's more developed needed what's your thoughts on the uv leds at the moment uv leds so we we know from the research that they don't provide the correct UVA put the brakes on UVB overproduction. This is something that's, you know, I've got my head around, but not enough to be able to really explain it to people. So this is, you know, if you want more on this, I think there's other more experts out there that can talk about it. But at this stage and from this, there was a study done with the UV lamp, uh, LED UVB, and they were using 0.3 UV index. So less than a tenth of the UV provided by this UV LED light, and it was producing. So as part of my, uh, study, I collected bloods. I had enough blood left over to run vitamin D, blood vitamin D levels in wild dragons. And from that study that they did, the amount of vitamin D in the blood that was produced from this UVB LED was at the higher end of what we saw bearded dragons in the wild the amount of vitamin D in their blood. So if there is this risk that these UVBs don't produce enough UV, the correct wavelength of UVA to put the brakes on the UVB production, if we put them at a basking spot, the UV index at the recommended level of 4.1, which is over 10 times the power of the UV index that this LED did, there could be some serious risk there. 
And once again, let's look at the wavelength of the sun and try to mimic that rather than going, okay, well, we can use less of this UVB from an LED or whatever. Let's mimic what we see in nature because at the end of the day, we have exotic animals. They are the, the definition of exotic animals means it's not domesticated. It's a wild animal. So let's give them what nature's provided for them in the wild and try to mimic that as much as possible to give them everything they need for what they've evolved for. So that's my thoughts on it at the moment. So, so how would you recommend, swinging back to visible light, how would you recommend owners measure their visible light content in their vivariums? So um, there's there's the, the easiest tool is the lux meter. Um, it's, uh, it's a tool used, it's not a reptile tool. It's photographers use it. Um, you know, people designing offices and stuff use it. Um, I, I use it here for work, but also in, in barns or, um, you know, conforming to animal welfare standards. Um, so it's a quite relatively quite uh, cheap. Um, cool. I have in my enclosure, I've got about 40 to 50,000 lux underneath the basking area. Um, and that's quite bright. That's quite too bright to look at. Whether that's appropriate, considering that in normal daytime, it's over a hundred. Midday sun, it's over a hundred. Um, I'm not quite sure. I can't give you a definite, okay, he's doing it at 50 or give me a hundred. I honestly, I know that, you know, when it is a hundred out there, the bearded dragons are sitting underneath the shaded areas, escaping, escaping the heat. So I don't think we need it at a hundred. Um, you know, the average lux that's going to be underneath, you know, just a basking lamp and a UV lamp is going to be low because in less than you know a couple of hundred so adding that extra um light into the cage you'll see an animal that's a lot more active um and you might you depending on how your dragon and its environment and its personality some bearded dragons will freak out some animals will freak out and some other bearded dragons will instantly recognize okay this is the way life's meant to be and keep on going so I've got a quite a complex question for you. So a welfare question. So this is a like a detailed one. But obviously we are talking about like you took like UVIs in the wild and you worked up the averages for and things like that. So we can find these sort of like sweet spots and different parameters. So how important do you think it is that we find the sweet spots? So maybe we find the sweet spots for power density in the future. Maybe we find the sweet spots for, you know, lux. Um, how important is it we find their sweet spots and give that to them? as a standard all day long versus if things were ramped up and then ramped down. And sometimes they have some like less ideal days on certain conditions of some days than others. Do you think it's like this Nirvana of welfare, they get their optimum all day long, or do you think they should have some days of variance and like maybe a little bit of a, a naff day sort of thing? Yeah. So obviously in um technology is changing and if you could ideally have something that ramped up like their true environment um then you could have uv visible light and infrared going across the whole enclosure and make your whole enclosure uh you know a mosaic of microclimates but you would need a massive enclosure we're talking you know for a bearded dragon probably you know 10 foot long or something like that um that would be an ideal world um, for, you know, an, a rampable system. Because as I was saying, UV is low in the morning, zero in the morning at dawn, and then it ramps up to the highest at the peak of the day, and then it goes back down, which is, you know, ideally if you had a ramping system that did the heat, the amount of light, um, then that would, and the UV, and then the animal, you would see your biphasic basking. They'd come out in the morning and then they'll come out in the afternoon and you would get nature. Unfortunately, the technology is not quite there yet. 
And then, yeah, and as you said, there'd be days you would we would it be good to incorporate days of okay thunderstorm today nothing cold weather today a rapid fluctuation um yeah that would be that would be something that we could really do um you know and when we say at the top of we have to understand that your setup to provide those fluctuating conditions your setup would have to be perfect so that animal is at the peak of its game, its immune system, everything. What we currently see with reptile keeping and a lot of, you know, bearded dragons are the beginner reptile. Its husbandry is down, like the level of husbandry is so low. If we incorporated suddenly having off days, stuff like that in an animal that's already subclinically sick, you're going to get an animal that, you know, collapses very quick. And this this is what we actually do see um, on forums, um, on Facebook. People go, oh, my my snake, my lizard, um, the light globe blew, blew. It's been two days and the animal's got a respiratory infection. This animal's been subclinically sick for the light bulb to go, be off, for two days is enough to tip it over. So, mm. you know, this is this is the level that I would say, you know, a lot of the herpological community are keeping their animals at, where these animals, is, you know, reptiles are typically keeping um, at, at subclinically sick, these animals, and they're so robust. Reptiles are such robust animals. Bearded dragons, the why they say, they're the beginner reptile is because they are so robust. They can be sick for so long and they appear well. And it's not until the light globe goes for two days. It, it can rain in the outback for two or three days. It can, you know, so for them to get sick that quick, there is some subclinical sickness going on. There is some husbandry problem. So, you know, in an ideal world, we would want everyone's husbandry, heat, light, UV, perfect. Then we can start throwing in days of where we don't have optimal conditions. And, you know, a bit of stress is good for animals. It's stimulating stuff like that. Um, but in our typical herpetological keeping, and it might may be skewed because I'm a vet, so I see all the bad examples, but if those keepers are trying to throw in those bad days, you're going to have dead days. So, um, you know, so I don't know. Can you understand where, you know? I I'll, think, I think it's probably like a, a pet level and then like yeah. a hepticulturist level. And I think yeah. that question was more aimed at like the hepticulturist level, but you're saying like the pet level, just stick to get the parameters right, consistent. And, yeah. 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 Let's get it like, you know, we've been, Bearded dragons are the most popular. We've been keeping them this long. And then, but we're keeping them wrong for this long. And it's not just because of what we don't understand. It's because of what the technology was available. These T5s have only just started, you know, becoming what we call mainstream now. Before this, so, you know, so we just need to get, I guess, technology level there and stuff like that. So, Well, um, I mean... Like, ironically, this morning I was scrolling through the feed and some bearded dragon breeder posted up, like, this bearded dragon that was really poorly and they were like, this is what happens if you put a water bowl in an enclosure. This has led to it having a respiratory infection, then it's going to die. You know, they're like, I don't think that was the cause, but okay. Like, you can't no. scaremonger providing an animal with water. It's a need. Yeah, that's it. And it's, you know, these these animals, they can handle humidity what they can't handle is humidity with poor temperatures that's you know it's um or or yeah it's just a combination there's something already going on for these things to happen because yes it does rain um it floods the ones i find further north it can be humid for weeks on end they can flood. It's like, you know, and they survive. It's, it's not, 
at their sentence. It's, you know, just because they're looking for some excuse and it's a con- it may be a contributing factor. It was damp and they were sitting in damp substrate because it's dampness, like cold and wet, is a lot colder than cold and dry. So, you know, that environment is going to stress the host and then it's going to tumble. So, so let's move into uh, territory and that space usage. So what sort of like territory establishing behaviour do you see from wild weather dragons? So from the research and from what we see, um, so, you know, a male will have his territory and within that territory he's got several females and uh, subdominant males will also be in there, but they will not display. So he'll display. So, you know, typically what beardy keepers say, oh, you see the beard stretch, um, that's a that's a display of dominance and territory. Um, they'll puff out their beard, um, but usually they'll do um, a male dominance display is the head bob, so it's the bob, bob like that. Um, that's the typical dominance display, and then the beard flaring, um, and they'll do that. They'll usually choose a prominent position where. They will do that regardless whether another male's watching, whether anyone's watching. They'll just do it themselves. No one's watching. They'll do it. It's what they consistently do out in the wild for a dominant male. Um, and during the breeding season, if you get another male, um, and they'll start both doing that and then they'll come and come to a head to combat. Um, and combat, they'll start doing the head bobbing, um, and then they'll face off head to tail and then they'll start lunging at each other's tail, trying to bite each other's tail and circling. And, you know, the victor, if he grabs the tail, bites it off, causes an injury, or um, the other one submits and then the other one will actually jump on his back and do a ride, sometimes stamp, sometimes bite on the back of the head. Um, and then the other one will then run off having his tail down and the male victor usually has his tail up. Um, so that's the usual combat ritual. It has some or none of those parts, depending on the communication and, and whether the other one's gone off. And it's usually, um, usually it's the largest male from the studies. It's usually the largest male that that will be the victor um, and go from there. So. so is it only males that hold territory or do females get like, a bit of territory with each other as well? So the females will live in a in an overlapping patchwork within the male's territory. Um, there isn't so much um, data on female combat or anything like that um there is probably there's other better people to ask um there's christopher wilde he did his phd on uh super females the temperature dependent um sex determined females um and they were talked to being more aggressive uh, and more male-like in their behavior and their characters um and you know in terms of what we see what was seen in the wild i haven't generally we we've only found a few females in an area they're generally not that close we've never seen females combat um never seen them with wounds out there in captivity i've had to euthanize injured females female to female um and yeah so I, from the study bearded dragons that are born in the area generally stay in the area so in terms of territory that's what they're they're staying in um they don't move far from where they're born 
So for the males, then, what sort of like territory size do they establish? So in our study, we ca- recaptured three animals, all males, and they were all within 100 metres of where we caught them, from where we first caught them. So we do know that it's within 100 metres. Um, Batam study found that the average was a 200 metre radius and then with a maximum of about 800 metres range, radius. Um, And once again, I'll refer to Dr. Christopher Wilde now with his PhD. He actually did radio tracking of males and... um, he found that some males actually moved up to two kilometers. So, oh, so, yeah. wow. So it's, yeah. you know, so it's, and I'd have to go back over it and look at his stuff, but, um, whether it was just them moving along, but I don't think it was them moving two kilometers, but it wasn't an established territory in two kilometers, obviously. So on the flip side to that, then courtship, what does courtship look like in the wild? So courtship is, so a female will determine when she's ready to mate. She'll um, bob her head slowly, submissive bob, and she'll actually approach the male and touch him with her tongue and then retreat away. And then he'll come up and he'll um, stand on her back like a dominance display. And then he'll bite her on the back of the head and then convert into intermission, inserting a hemipene. Um, if the female has not approached the male um, and the male actually wants to mate with the female and she's not ready and doesn't want to, the female might actually square off with the male like a full combat as well, which it can... Um, you know, obviously the male can back off or it can go to him trying to dominate her or her running off and trying to escape. So, um, that's what courtship looks like in the wild. Um, and it's somewhat, you know, the early stages of, of it are the same as combat. So, you know, a female in the position where the male's on the back biting her that doesn't want to breed it can quickly turn into a combat situation where we did come across females with injuries, um, bite injuries in the back of the head and one arm as well, which has most likely come about from uh, a male mating, a courtship that's gone bad. Do you see a difference in courtship and mating differences in like captivity? Because obviously I don't, I've seen lots of bearded dragons and I've, I've bred them in shops and stuff and been a part of that. I've never seen it be initiated by a female. It was always like a male, just like, let's go. Yeah. Um, you know, we're keeping them in small boxes. Um, you know, that they don't have the, the room. Like this communication is like when we found them in the wild. So during spring, we always found, you know, if you found a female, you'd look at a tree nearby or a pile and you'd see a male there is overlooking. And we're always talking, you know, five, ten metres away. So there's that distance between them. So there's that room for the communication to start. If you breed them, you put them in a box so big, there's not that communication that almost converts straight to go for it, combat, who you knows. So... So it'd be almost better like if you had a big space in the room, just let them wander the room and let it start naturally that way then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never heard anyone doing that, but it would be interesting to see whether if you had two enclosures facing each other across a room, whether you could start to see those behaviours um, in captivity and which, you know, these are instinctual uh, type behaviours, so we should start to more. So based upon all of that then, thoughts on cohabitation? So if you had a very large outdoor pit, I would say, you know, you're welcome to try. The animal can escape. Um, you've got to have escape places, but there's always that risk 
there's always that risk that can go wrong. Like, come on, we have animals in the wild, females in the wild where it's gone wrong. So keeping a pair in a large enclosure, a large outdoor enclosure, it, I've seen it done successfully. No problems. They choose their positions. Um, having them in a four foot box, I wouldn't recommend it, especially being a vet. We usually see about six to seven a year of limbs missing, jaws broken. Um, you have an upset client and then a more upset client when you tell them we have to try and fix the jaw and it's going to cost several hundreds of dollars. Um, and then suddenly you're the bad person. Um, but honestly, these animals, we know that there's a good chance that they will fight and they have the they have the tools to inflict some serious injuries to each other. And your role as a carer, as someone who is looking after an animal, is to give them the best welfare. And if you want to take the risk, put them together in a confined space where they can't escape, if they damage each other and fatally or serious injury, you have a responsibility to take that to a vet and cough up the money <laughs> as well um, to get it fixed or do the best thing by that animal. It's your responsibility. You take that chance. Um, you know, it's not a natural scenario for them to be locked up in a four foot box at close quarters without being able to escape. That's it. So um, that's what I say to all my clients, that it's their responsibility if they want to take that risk. My advice is not to do it, not to cohab them unless you want to breed them, obviously, um, but there's still risk there, but they are responsible for its welfare, its suffering if it happens, and financially is important as well because, you know, at the end of the day, if you have an animal that's seriously injured, it's going to cost money to fix it or euthanize it, um, or even finding, having a vet available to do that. You know, it's, you know, have a, a, a good reptile vet that, that knows what they're doing if an animal needs to get fixed. And that's just generally across the board. If you're keeping a reptile, find a good reptile vet before you have a problem so you're not scrambling <laughs> afterwards. So. I prepared a sort of like counterpoint to, um, people are being against cohabitation. So I think yep. I can guess what you're going to say, but I'm going to read this to you now, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts on this is. Some people say they have such like complex communication behaviours, like you described with the head bobbing and stuff. Um, and do you think in terms of not being able to express this entire like repertoire of behaviour, um, that it's not that great because they never get, to, if they never interact with another bit of dragon? So, it's... If we look at their communication styles or what they use the communication for, for breeding and for territory, I can't, like, I'm not a bearded dragon, so I can't say that, you know, they're not having a chat to each other or communicating socially as in, you know, let's have a beer type thing. I'm pretty sure generally they're not doing that. So if we look at it at that, so for breeding, unless you need to breed, you don't need to put them together. And then if it's establishing territory where it's known for them to, you know, combat, if it, they're male or male, or if a male's enforcing and is trying to enforce, get a breeding and she can't escape, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not really needed that I can't, you, you could have two enclosures on the other side of the room and they could communicate and have their territories. Um, there's, there's no real need to stick them together in a confined space and, you know, let them have a beer because I'm pretty sure that that's not, not why their communication has evolved. It's more for breeding and defense. So what are your thoughts then when when people say, oh, I've had these bearded dragons together for years, and then when I tried to separate them, they stop eating? Yep. So if we look at those two points, it's, you know, 
most likely there's a more deeper thing going in here. These animals, why wouldn't it eat? So, you know, you have two animals, they're competing for a resource. This is why they develop territories. Um, so if one animal's like, you've got a competitor taking a resource, you're going to eat as well, right? Most bearded dragons in captivity are overfed. Once you take away that, take away that competition, then why would it, it doesn't really need to eat. It's, it's doesn't, you know, it's, so it stopped there. But also the second thing is, is that we know from what a lot of people say about their dragons and their type of behavior. Oh, I moved a log. It's hiding. It's not eating. We've got these animals which have a complex environment in which they work in. So we go there and female dragons every afternoon during the breeding season, mouthful of termites. How do they know that? They know in their territory where it is. They've worked it out. They know their 3D landscape, the food, basking, everything like that. Um, so this, these animals that we stick in a cage, they sit there, do nothing all day. Their biggest amount of stimulation is you putting food in there. But other than that, they're bored as hell. They do nothing. They become, their brains shrink. They're not adapted for change. You create a sudden change in their environment. They stress out. They don't want to eat. What happens when an animal stresses out? It's not, oh, I'm just going to sit there and eat. It's, I'm going to try and deal with it. I'm not hungry. I'm just trying to escape. I'm just trying to deal with it. And that's, you know, a lot of these bearded dragons and the way they've been kept. We look at them in the wild and they're active animals. They're not these sit underneath the basking spot, sit there and do nothing all day. Um, they're actually quite active animals. Um, and when we put them in these boxes, um, you know, a lot of people won't put sand in, no mental stimulation. Um, they're just so stressed when we change something that they just go and they don't know how to deal with it. So it could be any one of those two factors. Um, but an animal not eating is, you know, there's something wrong. That's, you know, yeah, obviously you've changed its environment. It's, it's not, it's not from it likes being there. It's them stressing out that the environment's changed. So. Talking about um, enclosure size, what would you recommend as the minimum? So I kept bearded dragons, rescue bearded dragons, and they are in three and four foot tanks. This is 20 years ago. After doing my bearded dragon study, I would not keep them in a tank. Uh, in Australia, I'd keep them in an outdoor pit. There was, there is no way I would want to keep them. But in the context of reality and what people keep them in, um, yeah, bare minimum four foot to have a hot spot at the required temperature. Um, and to do it safely without overheating four foot. So you've got, you know, just a physical size that limit there. Um, but even a four foot, it's, it's nothing compared to what they have in the wild. You would have to make that enclosure like so complex sand areas to climb to really stimulate this animal. Um, so, you know, having a, a larger, you know, I would say, so now I'm living in Austria. Um, so within Austria and Germany, but the laws are, are five foot. Five foot by two foot by two foot is the bare minimum with six inch layer of substrate. You know, it's that, that, that would be more what I would see. Um, you know, and in a size like that, you know, if we want to go above what, you know, yeah, you're talking minimum. This is bare stock standard. Once you get to the larger ones, you can have multiple basking spots. You know, so, you know, just create a different and you could even go, okay, this lamp goes on at this time and it's more hot. 
right underneath in the center or another lamp that's you know just an early morning lamp or it would start fasting at the start and just provide some mental stimulation to get around but yeah four foot would be bare minimum five foot would be better an outdoor enclosure would be ideal and we had this conversation with our last guest, who it was is Thomas Griffiths. So we're going to like the, the insane basking spots that he creates and stuff. We came up with this sort of like concept of like in the next ten years, like six by three by three is the new four by two by two. Would you would you like to see that in the next ten years? Yes and no. Um, yes, um, because more is better, but at the same time. I want to see people think that keeping reptiles is a valid, you know, something they can do. And the problem we have with larger enclosures, not so much a bearded dragon. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, you know, it's about making sure you can heat the whole enclosure. Most people's apartments won't get below 18 degrees. So, you know, it's okay to have a basking spot that gets to 40 degrees and it can run around the rest of it at 22 during the day and 18, then it'll just keep running up. That's not a problem, but you know, if we get larger and especially some of the other species people keep, it'd be, um, you know, just trying to, for a beginner to get their head around every, all a bit of knowledge that an advanced keeper has. Um, it just makes it very difficult to, to kind of control it. And we could have, and just purely on the animal welfare side is we could have animals that can do quite well in a four foot. And then if you suddenly add that extra two foot, it would become a welfare issue where they would get sick and that would just be the level. So the bigger enclosures and more complex enclosures that you have to heat, you need some level of knowledge to do that properly, which I think would be a massive barrier to new people coming into the hobby. Like I'm not anti-hobby at all. Yes, we have problems with people buying animals without doing the right research. But also we've got to remember, you know, we don't change the world by just, you know, banning people. We've got to help them through it and get them get going. So, yeah. Very well said. So on the flip side to that question then, what are you thought what are your thoughts on when bearded dragons are kept in like the plastic trays and they bask in like egg crate when they're being used for breeders and stuff like that? Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, it's not a life. This day and age where we know how much mental stimulation and animal welfare, you know, it's at a point where you go, you know, even people that talk about no substrate and stuff because they could get sick and stuff. Yeah. You're eliminating the risk of sand ingestion, but. You've also taken away natural, oh, a fire freedom of expressing natural behavior. So, you know, don't think there is a need to breed these animals and such small things. It's people that are there purely to make money and do it. Um, you know, and I'm hoping as we move to the future, like people especially those coming into it. If we can get to them before they buy their first animal, I'll go, okay, I want to choose someone who ethically breeds their animal. Um, much like the dog industry, you go with, you know, there's puppy farmers and that's becoming more aware. You want people to buy it from registered breeders, done their health checks, eat the animals properly. Um, you know, so, you know, hopefully if we can affect those people coming into the hobby and they'll see a need for you know, to do buy animals from that have been bred properly, that will kind of like phase those people out that, you know, are just sticking them in small boxes and really, um, you know, having poor welfare standards. So when it comes to breeding, then, if, if someone's wanting to breed their animals, how would you recommend they go about that? Would you reckon, recommend they like let them come out and then they can like be present and be there to break up if it goes sideways? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely always watch it. And it doesn't matter what, like, other than farm production animals, any kind of companion animal or anything, we, we watch them when they breed because there's always that chance that something goes wrong. Um, yeah, 
I would definitely recommend them to, you know, especially mainly at the start. Like, yeah, sure, you if you've got a male and female and put them together, you'd watch them at the start and the interaction. If she's not ready and tries to escape and that male jumps on her, then you need to separate it. But if she's open to it, then it generally would go well from that point on. So, yeah, definitely, you know, keeping an eye on at the start, at the introduction of breeding. But, you know, it's, yeah. So in the past, you've just, I've, it's funny because I've transcribed everything you've ever said working on the Beard of Dragon deep dive I was going to do before I did the Royal of Oath one. So, um, you described Beard of Dragons in the past as wanting to see all around them and not wanting to like have their vision and like view distance impeded. Can you go into that a little bit for us? Yeah. So when we catch them out in the wild, so the positions that we find them basking in, um, they, it's always at their eye level. Um, they want to be able to see anything incoming. A lot of the females we find, um, they generally won't bask out in the open. They don't have to because they can get their heat. And when they bask, they bask under a light canopy, but it always, they can see, see what's coming. Um, and we, we never find them like, you never find them and then it's like a log there and they're like butted up against it basking. They don't like cornering themselves at all. They like to see what's coming. Um, even then, you know, we've seen them when, when we, I've come across them at the front of their escape burrows and they do not even want to go in that escape burrow. Um, they don't want to be cornered. Um, they're very reluctant to head in there unless they have to. Um, it's something that we go, you know, it's, it's very different to compare to something like, um, your, your hatchlings. Hatchlings we found in the wild are usually covered under something, um, where they only just have to expose themselves just a bit out before they can get to cover. Um, but, um, yeah, or in deep in bushes. But, um, yeah, the adults just want to be able to see. And, and they're a highly visual species. Like, you know, they've got bird prey coming. Um, they've got, you know, dingoes coming in the sides. So they, they want to be able to see. And first and foremost, they rely on their, um, you know, camouflage staying still. And if that fails, then they want to have a quick escape to somewhere. So they want to be able to see everything. It's, it's very typical. People call it the side eye. That side eye is them watching what that predator is doing. Um, is it coming for me? Has it recognized me? They will run once they're recognized. They, uh, yeah, they're very clued on to, um, the behavior of a predator, especially a human dog of, you know, focusing in on the animal. Then they know the game's up and then they'll run. So if they can see you, it's better. Whereas, you know, other species like snakes and stuff will usually bop themselves up against something and want to be tied up against something if they're basking rather than being exposed out in the open. Whereas a bearded dragon will want to be somewhat exposed so they can see something coming from a long way. Um, how do you think that keepers can strike the balance between giving clutter and then also that open space in the barbarians? Um, so it's important to have, I would say, like, you know, obviously when they're basking, have a basking spot under the heat that's somewhat elevated, but having a secondary basking area that's elevated and they can see out of the enclosure. Um, and then, you know, in between those two points, you can have objects on the ground, which they can escape to and hide. Um, it is hard, um, but also in terms of, you know, keeping them occupied, um, you know, stuff to climb over deep and stuff like that. Yeah, you want to have a 3D environment, but also you don't want to clutter it so they don't get overcrowded. So having two higher points at which they can see everything um, and you see some, I've seen some captive bearded dragons that love those glass enclosures and it's next to a window because it almost simulates what they would choose in the wild where they overlook everything and they can see everything coming. They can sit there and flex their beard for any other bearded dragons that may be watching to tell them that they're the king of the castle. So, In terms of like having that 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 
that basking spot. I want to flip back to a, a, a thermoregulation question because um, it's just popped into my brain. Some people use like UV and then an LED and then they'll use like a deep heat projector as the primary like heating source, but not overlapping. What are your thoughts on that? So, well, we just have to defer back to what the what does the sun do and in what amounts. Like we keep anything that we do different to what the sun is doing we are confusing them. They have evolved to, when, when I say evolved, even humans, every bit of life on Earth has evolved for what that sun provides. So if we have things like heat, UV, and light coming from all different areas, you're just confusing this animal. This animal, yeah, sure, they're smart enough to learn, but it's not optimal because everything comes in one beam out in the wild so you know just just having it set up the way with all over that one spot is the ideal what the sun would do um you know your deep heat projectors for example is just it's it's from the research it's an unnatural wavelength so um i use a deep heat projector in some other animals and they tend to dry out um, and I know another um, keeper um, who keeps and and he's quite a well-educated keeper as well he's actually got a PhD in lizards he noticed that a lot of his animals were drying out under that DP projector um, because it's just not a natural wavelength and um, I did ask a question on the forum once of reptile lighting and Sarah, Sarah uh, Wunderlich answered and she said, a deep heat projector emits UV, uh, infrared B at the same wavelength that heats water. And so it, so I, I then asked, well, the body, human bodies, other animals' bodies are 60 to 80% water. So isn't that ideal? And she answered, well, that's not what the sun does. It's unnatural. And when it's unnatural, you see the results. You see animals drying out more rapidly because the water heats in their body. And it's not meant to. It increases water loss. Well, that's what I would theorize if these animals are drying out and then shedding the water and stuff like that. And, and have been kept normally under radiant heat sources like halogen lamps and stuff like that. So even when you when that doubles up, then when you've got something like a leatherback who uses loses like fifty percent more hydration than a normal scaled bit of dragon, then that really compounds that effect. Then yeah, that's right. So yeah, that that study yeah showed that bearded dragons um it's leatherback um and uh um would lose water and silkbacks and stuff. Yeah, that would compound theoretically. As I said, you know you look at the science and it all seems to match up. Whether that in a controlled study has anyone done a DP projector with IRB? No, that hasn't happened. But once again, let's look back at what nature has and what we know of the wavelength and go from there. Do you think there's uh, any issues with the fact that it doesn't emit light? You know, confusing us to where the heat is. Because if you've got a really bright LED and UV here and then the deep projector, but the heat. It's coming from a deep heat projector, but it's not emitting lights. I find a lot of bearded dragons will sit under the jungle dawn or any other LED available, and I'll be like, "Oh, why am I not getting warm?" Because they're not choosing the deep heat projector because they're looking for light. That's right. Um, yeah, like well, this chameleon, for example, sits under the jungle dawn because they just pump out so much visible light rather than rather than the halogen. And it wasn't until I gave it an LED spotlight with the halogen, then it was like, oh, okay, here's the, the place where I'm meant to sit. Um, yeah, we're confusing them at the end of the day. Like, they, they're not stupid at the same time. Like, they've got thermoreceptors in their skin. They've got light receptors, parietal eye, um, lateral eye. So they can determine where heat's coming from, this, but instinct... The instinct always is go to the brightest spot because that's where the sun 
hits and there's the heat and the light UVA light, but they don't know UVB. It just comes as a benefit without them seeing it. Um, so, you know, definitely confusing them. They're going to what happens in the wild. They don't particularly seek just the heat. It's heat, light, all in one. So many keepers um, would describe bearded dragons as semi-arboreal. Would you agree with that distinction? Yes. Yes. So the numbers that we've, they want to sit on top of a bush. Males, uh, you know, we found them two to three meters up a tree. Um, we found a female on the ground, went for a toilet break in the bushes and then looked up on the tree we were urinating on and it's, there's a male bearded dragon sitting on the side of the tree. Um, they want that height there. Um, and it's not especially males, females, we'll see females occasionally on a bush or something like that, um, but we see them escape the bushes of many females that I've gone to go catch and they've jumped up a tree as an escape route from predators. So um, there, but males definitely use high basking spot. There's plenty of photos um, on the internet showing male bearded dragons high up in the point, and that's a need to survey and look over the territory and to be visible. So that's an instinct there. Um, so, and there's been a chase. There was one bearded dragon and he was on a plane, a flat plane, and there wasn't a tree for 50 meters. And I thought, here we go. Here's an easy bearded dragon for my study to bleed. I jumped out the car and he ran to that tree 50 meters away and climbed it. That tree was 30 meters high and he climbed to the top of it as an escape route. They can climb, they're well equipped to climb, and we do see them climb. So having a climbing area for them to survey from, um, they will use it. If you provide it, they'll use it. Yes, it provides a problem, um, yeah, because you've got then to put the basking spot up higher and rely on the fact that they want to be that high to thermoregulate, get UV. Um, it's a lot difficult to get the UV lower down in the enclosure and the heat if you've got a taller enclosure. So, you know, you can strike a balance there, um, but definitely you need that height. As I said, you know, they want that higher basking spot. So it's for them to feel comfortable. So if you provide that, they'll definitely use it. Yeah. I think a way to probably work around for that, if you're going to provide that height, um, you have like a little shelf. Um, in a corner, like a little square coming into the thing where it's like a basket spot from up high, they can sit and platform look out. But also, because it's wooden or something, you can put heating elements on the underside of it. So you can have a terrestrial basking spot and then like a arboreal basking spot sort of thing. Also put put like a basking like underneath the shelf. Yeah, so like uh, you put the, the basket on level. the shelf from the ceiling and then underneath yeah. the shelf is like another, another basket spot basking to the floor. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's definitely possible. Um, and you just got to remember if you have it in the corner, then you've got an animal that kind of is views more restricted rather than having it somewhere else that you know you can see all around. So, yeah, there's always but, a trade off yeah, in there. Yeah, that's it. But, yeah. So let's go the opposite way. We've talked about going up, let's talk about going down. So in the past, you've mentioned brumation burrows and then escape burrows. Uh, what are they and how do they differentiate? So we um, started seeing animals run into burrows. Um, and as I said, they were reluctant to go in the burrows if you could see them. And then if they went in and then we realized and most of them that they run into, um, you know, they all seem to be this kind of like an entrance hole and then like a bell shaped area. Well, not a bell. It's kind of like a, elliptical area and then they'd run in and then they'd wedge themselves up against the edge of it as an escape. So obviously, you know, they're quite rough as well and they kind of wedge themselves in there and can't get out. And, um, you know, it's quite open. They have lots of room to turn around in and everything like that. And then we have uh, the brumation burrows and we've uncovered a few ones that have been brumating 
and they're always so we uncovered one that was in a sand bank on the edge of the road and he was coming out and we looked down it and it was tight you know he would have to really squeeze in there nice and tight to use that and then we had another dragon which was um there was this log lying in the sand and it was right up the end of it quite deep underneath it. and um it's quite tight actually um we just found it because we flipped the log and it was quite a long log um and where they brewmate it tends to be quite a bit deeper than these escape burrows these escape burrows they pretty much only use during the active season um they will sleep in them only for a short period in the spring and late autumn when the nighttime temperatures get really cold um still and the daytime temperatures are getting really warm um but once once you get to the end of spring the nighttime temperatures have risen to you know above 15 degrees and they'll sleep out in the open because they do not like being in um cornered in a burrow obviously the predators out there um uh because they have blind ended tunnels um the predators out there you've got you know numerous species of snake which prey on them and are active at night so they want to spend as little time in an escape burrow as they need to because they're cornered um but the brumation burrows uh, are a very tight um well insulated um but also you get ones that are so if a bearded dragon it either chooses a really deep like the deep one in the sandbank was about more than 30 cm deep in that sandbank um and you know from other studies on uh, burrowing mammals that burrow in the same area um and have similar length and depth burrows um during the winter it stays at about 15 degrees celsius the whole of winter there is very little fluctuation there whereas the bearded dragons there are some bearded dragons that will choose a more shallow burrowing site and it will fluctuate between being like less than 10 degrees at night and then getting the sun of the day even though it's 21 degrees or 18 degrees outside it still gets up to about 17 degrees underneath there and those ones will actually come out during the um warmer days in winter we do have most of the time where they're found it's can be anywhere between 12 and 21 usually during the winter but then um some of those days sometimes you get a hot spell in the middle of winter and it's 23 to 25 degrees 27 degrees and they'll actually come out to bask and then go back into that uh, shallower brumation burrow under a log or something like that so i've seen you say before in the past that um they need sort of like 23 uh, 21 degrees to 23 degrees air temperature before they start to emerge and start to have a little bit of a bask at the end of brumation uh, why do some captivity remain sleeping even when the temperatures in their environment well exceed an air temperature of like 21? Because I've done it as well, because I've I've obviously looked at everything you've said online and I've like played with it and like seen, I was like, I wonder if I'll see like a 23, she'll like wake up or something. But yeah. I could have it like 27, she's like sleep for another month sort of thing. Yeah. And are you taking a the body temperature of the bearded dragon or just the air temperature in the enclosure? Air temperature, because you described yeah. air temperature, so I stuck yeah. with that. Because we've had one of the dragons that was still brumating its air temperature was 22 or 23 degrees the surface temperature of the burrow was 20 degrees but the actual temperature of the bearded dragon was 11 degrees so um you know you can look at the 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 body temperature of the bearded dragon that's one thing but having said that that was based off batam study and what we're seeing as well no one fully understands brumation in reptiles and what the cues are to get them out of brumation we don't know whether they can detect barometric changes so what happens in australia during the different seasons the high pressure cell it goes as you go down the um the latitude 
you get high pressure system, low pressure system, high pressure system, and that shifts between summer and winter. So we don't know whether they're detecting that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, um, daylight length because if they're hidden underneath there, they can't detect it. Um, we don't know about electromagnetic fields either changes there. There actually is a study where they, they did a study on the, um, parietal eye and they only gave it a certain wavelength of light and they realized that it needed to be exposed to a certain wavelength of light. Otherwise it couldn't detect electromagnetic changes in navigation. That, that was actually in lizards. That's an actual study. Um, so whether they can detect that and, um, well, obviously they can detect electromagnetic, um, directions and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, well, no one fully understands brumation. Um, you know, we use the term brumation. It was created by someone. Um, but these days amongst scientists, they actually go, you know what? It is hibernation. It's not brumation. Hibernation in a bear, hibernation in a reptile, you know, it's the same. It is, there is no need to distinguish, but I don't think anyone fully understands the cues, um, in rumination slash hibernation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can go off what evidence we do have and what we found and what Batam found and that's um, what we're going off. But there definitely could be other factors that we, we can't, we don't know. We don't know where to look. We're not measuring it right. So. Um, what are your recommendations for brumation in captivity? So um, I know there's two methods um which are regularly used um there is you know they go to roommate they go down for a week okay they're definitely not coming out switch off everything and then once the weather turn warms up switch it back on and go from there um you know that's good if they're brumating and you can get your temperature below you know 15 degrees reliably and it will stay below 15 degrees Celsius the whole time. But from what we see in the wild, where they're coming out, if there's warm days, when the air temperatures are getting to, you know, 25, 27 degrees, so they will come out in bars. So a lot of people who are keeping bearded dragons where the nighttime temperatures aren't low, and if there is a warm day or the apartment's at 21 or something, um, I say to still provide heat and basking spot at the same 42 degrees, but just for shorter hours, four to six hours a day, just in case you do have a barometric change and the weather outside does warm up so that in, your ambient temperatures inside do warm up and then they can come out and bask for a few hours. And I've kept bearded dragons that way. Um, I still provide them with heat, but just at shorter times. So. Um, you know, reduce it from 12 hours a day to eight hours a day to six hours a day down to four hours a day right at the winter solstice uh, and then go back the other way and still give them the opportunity. And I used to keep all my reptiles and dragons in a garage. So it's, it's, it, if it's, if you get a warm winter day, you do get warm air temperatures in there. And they did, if, if it was more than 21, 22 inside, the garage when it happened, um, they would come out and bath. And then as soon as those few days of heat were over, um, and it went back to being cold temperatures again, they would just stay down. But I still have the light on and just for the reduced hours. So, so there's the two ways there. Um, yeah, it's always hard to really recommend a hard and fast because it's very much dependent on how you keep them, where you keep them in your house and what they're exposed to. Um, as we can produce so. Here's a question for you. I know you like this one. So what are your thoughts on bearded dragons in the northern hemisphere sleeping during the summer here? And then people saying, oh, it's them brumating because they're like instinctually remembering that it would be winter in Australia this time of yeah. year. So um no, that's not that's so what we did experience. So we went out 
late summer one year, and this was during um, my study was done during Australia's you know centenary drought, like one of the worst droughts we've seen. It peaked in those you know massive bushfires and everything like that. And we went out there, and the summer we it was end of summer, like late February, early March. And the days were like 40 degrees and the nights hadn't been below 30 degrees for a month. And we saw no bearded drag. Why? Because, and, and this is typical in the hottest part of the year, breeding activity stops at around Christmas, the summer solstice, and then you get this intense heat where the nighttime temperatures stay high. So, they instinctively, in the peak of summer, they estivate. Why? Because in the peak of summer, there's no food around. It's too hot for any greenery. Um, so they're not out because it's too hot. The higher temperature they are, their metabolism increases and they use up food reserves. So in the wild, when it gets to the hottest part of summer, they will stay in their escape burrows or stay sheltered out of the sun, trying to stay as cool as possible and don't bask because basking is causing them to, you know, use up energy, which really you're in an arid environment and they don't have that energy available. And it's not until you get to the end of, depending on what the season's like, until those temperatures and not on temperatures start coming down and then they'll start coming out. The thing that cues them to come out and start basking is the rain because when the rain comes, termites come to the surface and then they start, they so they get water and they get food and then they need to metabolize that. So it's not this throwback to, you know, my Australian ancestors in the outback. It's they're doing what they're meant to do, which is reduce the basking reduce using up energy until further later in the season when the food supply becomes more prominent. Even though, you know, there's someone there giving them greens and as many woodies as, uh, as many roaches they can eat within 15 minutes type thing, even though there's heaps of food that no, their instinct tells them, no, this is the peak. The days are the longest um, to preserve myself um, and use the least amount of energy as possible. Uh, what would you say like when some I think some people my bear dragon would just sit in the corner in the cool end and just sit there and just watch the day go by when it's this time of year. Um what would you say when someone's got a bear dragon that's actively like asleep this time of year in the northern hemisphere they shouldn't be? Get it checked out by a vet. Um if as in sleeping as in like brumation type sleeping. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. I would definitely get it checked out. Um, you know, this is their active season. Um, I think we've just come past the summer solstice. So, you know, there will be some reduction of activity. Males, their testes are shrunk um, and they're at a point where, you know, they're not worried too much about territory. So it is, you know, it's the summertime. They're meant to be more active and at least alert. If they're not alert, get it checked out by vet, find out everything's going well. A lot of the time, um, if it's sleeping, it, it could be sick females that have, are egg bound or have a rotten egg inside them. Um, you know, they go lethargic. Um, the peak of the summer. So we also get, you know, in this estivation time, it's a stressful time for them as well. And their intestinal parasites increase as well, just because their body's under stress. And if they've, their intestinal parasites have gone out of control. Um, it's causing pain and lethargy as well. So, um, yeah, definitely get it checked out. Um, get bloods done if um, that's what's required by the what the vet thinks, and then get to the bottom of it. Because, yeah, no, they shouldn't. When they estivate, they're still alert. They're not, you know, it's not the same state as a brumation. So they still like stick your head in there. The ones that you know in the hottest of summer and we found them. They, they still, they'll see you and they'll take off, but they're just, you know, in a rest, resting state, trying to stay out of 
direct style and stuff like that. They just really want to sit in the corner and stay as cool as possible. So let's go into the ground of the of their habitat then. What was the substrate that you were fi finding in the wild? Um, so throughout pretty much that whole our whole survey area, um, it is what we call Australian red desert sand. It is sand, um, you know, and um, it's red because of the iron oxide, uh, but it's it's very much the typical outback sand that Australia has. Um, this was actually, I, I didn't know it was that much of an issue until I started going, okay, this is what I'm doing, and everyone's like going on about sand. So I actually had questions like inbox full. It's clay, right? It's not sand. It's hard packed. And I'm like, you know, I've been out to the center of Australia several times and it is, it's sand to me, but I'm no geologist. So, um, I actually collected some and I, I sent it away and it came back as pretty much 90% silica sand. Um, and you know, if we look at the evidence why they're ingesting sand, which is a normal inanimate part of their environment, and what's the reason for it, there must be something wrong. Um, in my veterinary career over 10 years in Australia, I would five to seven cases of sand ingestion like full on sand ingestion. Um, it's not high. Um, you know, whereas in countries like the US, um, I'm not quite sure. I've been told that the UK, it's pretty high. A lot of vets will see them in the UK as well. Um, they'll see a lot of sand ingestion and we just, you know, you have got to have a look at it. And so after hearing about this and looking back, I, you know, I look back at the cases. And, you know, this is going back a while and you look at it and every one of the cases is, uh, most of them were young growing animals, i.e. high calcium requirement, um, and poor UV. So we have, um, an animal that eats something that's unnatural. It's called pika. Unexplained reason. So you got to look at it, you know, in every other animal, humans and other animals, it's nutritional deficiencies. It's, um, or psychological reason, you know? Um, yeah, sure. So it leaves you really two options there is really, you know, nutritional imbalance, which let's be realistic. The ones I've seen. They weren't under proper UV. They were under things that said would have UV. But now that I think about it, where they were basking, it was pretty much zero UV. Um, they're fed um, things with high phosphorus, not getting enough calcium. So they want to try and ingest something to get the calcium. Um, and then, you know, and obviously, you know, they're the, they're the animals that are going to start ingesting sand. There's a study done um, at the uh, Vet Med University in Vienna and paired with, um, they worked with uh, Bruno in the Czech Republic and some other private clinics. And they looked at the amount of sand ingestion in um, captive um, bearded dragons that presented. And in over half the cases show indications of metabolic bone disease um, and parasites. So there's husbandry problems going on there right away. So, um, you know, we've we got to look at underlying reasons why they're ingesting sand. Um, and I'm looking back at it now, I, but the small number of cases I look at, go, okay, metabolic bone disease is the cause most of the time um you know i saw a lot more animals that are um have 
you know, impacted with food um, and problems there. Um, but, you know, it's one of those myths or symptomatic treatments. It's eating sand. Let's put no sand. We're not, we're not solving the problem. We're just ignoring the real cause of the problem. And if you look at, you know, the way they, they're kept, you know, in, in other countries, like in Australia, we, we know to, it's always been told, yep, take them out into the sun. That's not a problem. Even in the middle of winter, you've got enough UV for a bearded dragon if you take them out. Um, whereas in, you know, US, UK, Europe, there's no winter sun. Um, you know, whether you can take them out in the sun's another thing. So, um, you know, so it's, it's a very, uh, Hot topic, a very you get you know people that are quite quite uh, passionate about it, and but we we need to look at it because you know it's you look at the reasons for it and what we can do, and but also knowing it's a natural part of the environment and we know they dig, and if you don't have the sand there um, or the loose substrate, then you're depriving your animal, and we, you should go okay. If you don't want to keep it with that, which is a big part of their what they like to do, whether you're providing the best welfare for them. So you described as it being like ninety five percent sand in a while, known like two percent clay. Uh, we both keep on just like the quartz play sand. Uh, do you have any experience just keeping on just pure sand for bearded dragons in that way? Um, I've been lucky enough. Um, I was dug sand from the arid region <laughs> that That's was literally with the sand and you <laughs> stick it in and then you pour a whole bunch of water on it and it sets it sets and they can dig a burrow into it um and it's it's it can be quite fine it's, there's a lot of dust you get a lot of dust out of it um i know a lot of keepers um do keep um on quartz sand and they're those animals i, I do remember doing enemas with large amounts of just normal quartz kids play sand coming out of it um you know it's it's hard for me to recommend like i can't i've never seen one impacted with red desert sand but you know it might just because no one had access to it as much um but having them on sand um you can add clay to it to bond it so it is like out in the wild like you know it's not a hard and fast rule um what they do like doing is digging a burrow into the sand so or into the substrate so if you can get a substrate like quartz and then add some clay to it so it does have the opportunity to to build a burrow um and dig through it then you're providing you know it the opportunity to perform an actual behavior which is one of the five freedoms uh, and all of that. So. Yeah, um, we, I tend to like provide like a, like a log over or like a cork round over like a deep patch of sand and my dragon tends to like dig out a gap beneath it. So I was like, okay, she's getting to dig a little bit, but yeah. That's very typical of what we see out in the wild. Um, that's what their escape burrows are like um, or some of them even dug dig their rumination burrows up a log like that. So, yeah, that's very much ideal for creating, um, you know, allowing them to create, uh, to perform a natural um, behaviour. So. Um, what role, then, does parasites play into impactions as well? So, typically when a bearded dragon comes in with parasites, so, you know, you've got your... Your parasites are either going to be your coccidia uh, or your flagellates or your pinworms. Um, you know, and the, the different ways that they reproduce um, will sometimes, it, it affects on what, what we see. Um, the coccidia and the flagellates, they reproduce by invading the intestinal cells and then um, they actually break down the intestinal 
lining when they reproduce and burst out of a, a cell. So they actually cause an enteritis. So irritation of the intestinal lining. Um, and so they're in, they're natural parasites, which we see. All those parasites are ones that are natural. We know coccidia, um, and the flagellates, when the female, when she lays her eggs, she coats the egg in these parasites. And then when the, the bearded dragon hatches, um, it's actually infected with the cysts of these parasites. And then it goes on. That's how they survive. They're a direct life cycle. Um, so, and then pinworms, we suspect they, uh, um, passed on the same way, but preliminary studies I've been doing um, with the parasitology department at Sydney University, we couldn't determine that um, based on using some um, infertile examples. But um, these parasites are natural to them. Um, and somewhat your pinworms, uh, they're actually, they break down cellulose inside the um, intestinal system of the bearded dragons. We know that bearded dragons actually cannot digest plant matter so well, and they believe that pinworms, because bearded dragons, an adult, is going to be 80% of the diet, it's going to be um, plant matter. We believe that the pinworms actually aid in digestion. Um, so any time we see an overgrowth of these parasites, we can pretty much use it as a gauge to say, okay, the animal's stressed. It's immuno stressed, immunosuppressed. And that's allowed because usually the reptile's immune system keeps these parasites under control. And what we see is, depending if there's overgrowth, it causes pain in there. Um, so they'll want to eat less. Um, but also when it damages the intestinal lining, they can't absorb water as well, so we get dehydration. Um, and in some cases, we get animals that can't absorb water, so we see them with loose stools. And then in other cases, we see animals with so much pain that their intestines stop and they actually get impacted. And it builds up. So, you know, and it's all because there's what we a, a dysbiosis of the intestinal fauna, the gut biome, pretty much something which is a very much an advanced, um, advancing um, science that we're starting to see. So, you know, it's a natural, these are natural parasites and the overgrowth of them is what causes the problem, not the fact that they're there in the first place. So when you see some veterinarians that are like adamant, like get rid of it, get rid of it, have nothing there, do you not agree with that then? No. Um, early stages of my veterinary career, um, and, and it's just purely based on what the literature was out there and what some of the, you know, some of the, the reptile, old reptile vets, what they kind of understood of it. Cause we've come a long way, um, in understanding. Um, it's not good for them. You see people going, going to the vet or constantly wanting to hit them with, um, you know, the medications for it and, you know, some of the, the medications for it, the, the antibiotics, they kill other gut flora and the animal is just, it causes pain um, because some of the um, parasites are within the cell of the intestine, so it even causes more pain. Um, and then you have this prolonged thing and then they return, the parasites return, and it's not because they haven't fully cleaned out the enclosure, it's because... These parasites, when they reproduce, they form cysts or they're encased in eggs and they can, they don't have to leave the body to reproduce. And so they're protected in that cyst. So, you know, it's something they naturally have. And if your animal is showing problems where it's got overgrowth, which are causing clinical signs, then it is due to a husbandry problem or some other stress problem. Um, we had, I've had clients who had poor husbandry. We fixed it all and they were going really well. Perfect. No more problems. Then representing with overgrowth of pinworms and coccidia. 
um, I go, okay, what's happened? The husbandry, husbandry's was in crew. Um, and then I further investigated it and those animals had liver tumors or some other thing, some other thing that was immunosuppressing them to cause that problem. So parasites is a secondary problem. It's saying that you've got something else wrong. 99% of the time, just like every other illness in captive reptiles, it's husbandry. Um, but there's always those cases. It's really anything that's causing immunosuppression. Sure. If there's an overgrowth and it's causing clinical signs, yeah, we treat it, but we fix the primary cause. That's the best way to do it. Um, which is, you know, that's the best way to go about it. Um, typical so times when I do see overgrowth, um, uh, male and female dragons coming up to breeding season in breeding season males in particular um and many of the um the morphs um get an overgrowth of um uh flagellates um and somewhat coccidia and that's just because you know it's a stressful time breeding time um you know they're not basking as much as they should because they're trying to display and do all these things um, and then females naturally, like every other animal species out there, their immune drops. A pregnant female, the immune system drops, and then that's the time when parasites will transfer to the next generation. If you look in dogs, it transfers through the placenta to the puppies. Um, but in bearded dragons, it increases in the females. You know, reptiles are fantastic animals. The reproductive tract, the urinary tract, and the the um, gastrointestinal tract come up through the same hole. So coats the egg, coats the new young, if it's a live bearing species, with cysts of these parasites. So, um, you know, so we see a lot of problems around breeding season. Um, you know, it's, but other than that, during a normal season, non-reproductive animals, generally they're pretty strong. And if they do have problems, it's due to husbandry. Do you think the no substrate uh, ethos plays a role in like arthritis in bearded dragons on joints and stuff like that? So, it's yes, uh, yes, somewhat. When we look at using no substrate, you have an animal that's not active because it's not digging, so it's loses muscle mass and it relies on carrying its weight purely on its bones and joints. Whereas if you have an animal with substrate that can dig and has a lot better muscle mass, a lot better condition, it's not going to be as overweight, not going to be as obese, but there's a lot less stress on the joints because, you know, the muscles are there to support the bones and the tendons, and the joints um, by using no substrate you're you don't give them the opportunity for that physical activity which is a welfare issue it's going to sit there become this fat dragon that has no muscle mass so it's more stress on its joints um you know we look at you know wild dragons uh you know they're mixed martial artist fighters they're tough and toned and then you look at bearded dragons in captivity and they're you know Catch potatoes, so you know it's 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 worlds apart. We've, we've you know we're we're not we're not doing favors for them um, by keeping them like that. We're not doing favors by not providing them with things to dig, not providing things for them to climb. Um, they're super active animals out in the wild. Um, you know, if you put them in something with no environmental enrichment, nothing to do any activity. Um, their bodies are going to waste away, just like a person that sits there and does nothing. They're not going to be a peak of health. They're going to have problems getting up and so on and stuff like that. So let's go into hydration before we dive into the diet after you've mentioned about the size of them and stuff. So let's just really define where do bearded dragons get their water from in the wild? So most of their water is coming from um, the food that they're eating. It's it's an arid environment. You do get spouts of rain, you know, springtime. Sometimes you get rain and it's like, you know, every afternoon for 
three or four days and then it's hot again. Uh, but most of it, they're getting through their food. Um, they're out there. You've got your leafy greens type things. You've got your herbage, uh, your flowers, and most of that is water. And even the termites are high amounts of water. So that's where they're getting most of it. Um, you do see them come out in the rain um, or coming up to a storm and not just for the termites, but also because they'll stand there in the rain raised up and the water will run down their body and they'll drink it. So um, they do get it from rain. Um, but yeah, but a majority is from, a, is from their food. And the secondary question I'd like to ask you is, do bearded dragons need to be bathed? So, when you say need to be bathed, depends for what reason. If they walk through their feces, yes, bath them. Um, but the general, the keepers that bathe their bearded dragon so they can defecate um, is, once again, that's a that's trying to solve a problem that's caused by poor husbandry. Um, you know, it's that they're, they're not defecating because the temperatures aren't high enough um, to digest properly and move everything through. Maybe they've got secondary back uh, parasite infections, not enough UV, stuff like that. And, you know, putting them in water, or it, it makes them use their whole body. So, you know, it's going to move the gut contents through and go to the bathroom. But, if your husbandry is correct, you should not have to bar them at all. Um, it's, it's not something I've seen a bearded dragon in the wild in the water once. And that was only because we chased it and it swam through the water. Um, I've never witnessed one sitting in a puddle of water. Um, but having said that, you know, it, it could have been drinking from the water. I'm not quite sure. It, it had plenty of opportunity. It could have done that. Just like, you know, if you put a water bowl in your enclosure, it has the opportunity to drink. So, um, but yeah, but bathing a dragon for it to go to the bathroom, to the toilet, is any animal you keep. If you have to do that for it so it can go to the toilet, it's a welfare issue. It should be able to perform normal bodily functions um, on its own. And an animal that's not doing that, naturally, you should question, one, there's something wrong with the animal, or, and you know, and so you need to fix it, whether it's genetic, it can't naturally do it because of some genetic problem, or your husbandry's wrong. And Some people say that, they bathe them to hydrate them and they can absorb water up the cloaca. What are your thoughts on that? So I guess um, there's a video, which I did, an experiment, um, where I bathed the dragon in um, contrast solution, uh, which would pick up if it did absorb um, any fluids up through its cloaca, and it didn't at all after one hour of bathing um, and taking an x-ray. Um, and it's not, it's not a natural way for an arid animal. It's far more effective for them to drink water and absorb it through that route than it is to go up the other end because it's, it's, they're designed to take water in through their mouth. Um, just like most animals, um, that are terrestrial arid species. So, um, if you bathe them, it gives them an opportunity to drink, which, you know, but most of the time, if your husbandry is correct, um, they should be getting enough from their food. And we feed them way more than they would get in the wild. Um, so there shouldn't really be a reason. Um, ways that I've actually given water to my bearded dragons is to mist them down once a week and let the water droplets go on them and they'll happily lick it or they'll lick where the puddle is formed in a bit of a log or something inside the cage. And um, that's that's actually an, a natural way. If it rains out in the wild and where a puddle forms on a log or just next to where they're basking, they'll come and lick that. So that's much more natural and 
they seem to respond to that better than just having a bowl in there the whole time. So let's dive into the diet then. Can you cover the calcium to phosphorus ratios for us, please? So when we talk about calcium to phosphorus ratio, so this is something that's known about amongst humans um, and animals, dogs, cats, and in formulating their food. So in a, uh, in a human and in a, a dog or a, a cat, it's generally about when we say calcium to phosphorus ratio, when it eats a diet, you want to have calcium for a dog or a cat at about 1.2 to 1.4 to calcium to the amount of phosphorus of one, 1.2 to one. In reptiles, the generally accepted amount of calcium for phosphorus is two to one. You want twice as much calcium in the diet as your phosphorus. And how they get the calcium? So in something like a snake, when they're eating calcium, it's bones. Um, and then the phosphorus is muscle tissue, meat tissue. So when we talk about calcium and phosphorus, reptiles is two to one. In a rapidly growing reptile, so they found in crocodiles and turtles and tortoises that are rapidly growing, it goes up to you need seven times the amount of calcium to the amount of phosphorus. And they're in the rapidly growing and they have a lot of bone. In the bearded dragons, when they're growing rapidly and we're feeding them a lot, their calcium requirement would go to three to four. Three or four to one, the amount of calcium they would need to phosphorus. And especially people that are feeding them high calorie, um, high calorie, high protein things like, you know, uh, you've got your du dubia roaches, your crickets, that's all high energy, uh, protein. So these animals are going to be growing and they're usually feeding them what, 15, as much as they can eat in 15 minutes, three times a day. And so when you're putting that much energy into a growing animal, it's going to grow and the amount of calcium requirement will go through the roof. Unfortunately, crickets general, generally the insects that we use for bearded dragons are very high in phosphorus and very low in calcium. So for example, um, Jubia roaches, there was a study and they found the common one that they feed, um, in some cases, it had it had a calcium phosphorus ratio of one times calcium and twenty three times the amount of phosphorus. So it was massively reversed of what it should be. So, getting that, and this ties in closely with what we call metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone disease is multi could be from multiple reasons. It can be from the amount of vitamin D, not enough heat. Um, and um, not enough calcium, but it can also be having from too much phosphorus in the diet, because the blood, the blood uh, calcium level needs to be at a ratio with the blood phosphorus level. And if there's a suddenly increase in phosphorus, the blood has to try and get calcium to a certain level. And the biggest calcium store in a body is its bones. So it, its body tells it to pull the calcium out of the bones. And that's when you have, you get your bone problems with the metabolic bone disease. So, yeah, so that's pretty much the calcium phosphorus ratio. So based on that, then, what are they eating in the wild? So in the wild, so from the study from Judith Adam, she looked at dragons over a three-year period, juvenile, female, and male, from juvenile to adult, and found that they went from a majority of insects, well, when I say majority, not about 20 to 30% insects as a juvenile, and once they hit reproductive size, they switched over to males having um, an 80% uh vegetation diet and 
females having about a 60% vegetation diet. Um, and that was based on dry weight. So we do know that vegetation um, is higher in water content. So once you do it to, you convert it to having moisture in it, the amount of leafy greens um, and veggies is a lot higher in terms of weight, live weight. So in the wild, they're eating um, flowers. Um, we've got salvia rabanica, which is um, wild sage they're eating. Um, they do eat um, some wild type hibiscus, uh, native Australian native bluebells, um, flowers, and all of these veg vegetation out there, for example, wild sage has a calcium phosphorus ratio of 22 to 1. 22 times the amount of calcium to phosphorus. So, you know, an animal that's out there, even when it's growing, is still getting large amounts of calcium if it's eating greens out there. And when I say when she did a study of juveniles versus adults, the sexual maturity that she was going off was females at a snout to vent length of 13 centimetres, 13 to 14 centimetres, and males of 11 snout to vent length. So we're talking animals which are, you know, 25 centimetres long, you know, less than a, a bit over, um, you know, what, 12 inches, less than, that's, that's what you call an adult. So, you know, most people's bearded dragons will get that size in like a month or two in captivity if they're feeding them heaps. So, you know, converting them over to that majority vegetation, unless you're a breeding female, is um, I ideal to do, you know, as soon as the dra um, your dragon has some any size to it. Yeah. So it's better to grow those like juveniles much slowly rather than like the, the rapid if growth. You, yeah. If you grow them much slower, the amount of calcium they need to account for the growth is a lot lower. Um, and, you know, in the wild, these dragons aren't reaching sexual maturity. So once again, when I say sexual maturity, snout the vent length of 11 centimetres in males, and 14 in females, they're not getting to that start size until the second season, the second year of life. Whereas in captivity, they're getting to that size within about two to three months, which is just a massive, you know, this animal isn't designed to grow that fast. I guess it could if you got the nutrition right, but a lot of the time the nutrition isn't right. And that's why we see a lot of problems. See, I think that, I feel a little bit like um, my male was really tiny. He's like a year old and he still looks like a baby. But yeah. I have to remind myself that's what they're meant to look like. Like he is that, he's probably like hit adult sexual. Like yeah. 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 He's so, on the borderline. Yeah. yeah. So with the males will get to at the, the first males that are born, the first clutch, by the end of the first season, they will get to that 11 centimetres just in the wild. But in, um, yeah, in captivity, people are getting them, you know, getting them the full, like, you know, almost full size um, within six months, which is just crazy. Um, and in clinic, I think the earliest, earliest female that we had gravid was an eight month old female, whereas she would not be gravid until she's usually about, you know, 14 months old or something like that. So, so building off of this then, how, often and how much should we be feeding our juvenile bearded dragons? So um, what I usually recommend clients to do is to give them, um, you know, five or six uh, size protein items, cricket, roach, um, the size between their eyes, just as a size wise, give them five to six. Um, and then that volume, you give them um, three times as much vegetables and you have it there, and then you just do that once a day. This is for the first early period when you get them small, and that will they'll grow. They'll grow quite rapidly, and once you get them, because when, when you first get them, they're about 8 grams, 9 grams. Once you get them to about 30 to 40 grams, you can start feeding that 
every second day and just really slow them down. Um, you know, ideally, generally slowing them down so that, you know, it will take them, you know, at least six months to get to about this big and keep them lean. If you start seeing them start getting, it, it's hard because it's like us looking at Labradors. Everyone thinks Labradors are meant to be fat and rolly, but once you see a working Labrador, you don't know what type of dog it is because you've never seen something like that before. Because you, society just doesn't know what a normal looking Labrador looks like. Um, and I feel that society doesn't know what a normal bearded dragon is meant to look like. Um, so it's really hard, but if they come in and it's starting to look fat around the midsection, I tell them to stretch it out an extra day for feeding, um, just to slow them down because it's, it's so hard because of genetics. Um, it's so hard to go, okay, you must feed them this much, this, and then they get to this size. Um, it's all about portion control. If you go, okay, I'm feeding five items of the size between their eyes and then, you know, three times as much veggies by weight. And then at least if you go, okay, it's getting fatter. Okay. Reduce it to four roaches or crickets and then keep the veggies the same and again you know you keep putting it down or up depending on the way the stomach's going and this is how you know this is a lot more reliable way than going okay it must be this way or you know you must feed this um and that works for you know all species um you know humans if you want to go there as well <laughs> if i'm starting to look a bit fat i just you know ease up on my ice cream portion every night <laughs> Um, we've actually prepped the body condition oh, uh, pictures of our all of our our three bearded dragons for you to look at the body condition so people get a reference later on. But before we go down that route, um, you mentioned obviously saying like three to four like crickets. I just want to specify you mean individual insects and not four boxes of crickets. I just want to just oh, yeah, specify, yeah. yeah, 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 individual. Like they they would get they'd be lucky to get the number of insects that we give them, that people are giving them, like some of the recommendations of as much as they can eat in 15 minutes for three times a day and people complaining that their, their bearded dragon is costing them a bomb because they've gone through, you know, three or four boxes of crickets in the week and stuff like that. It's just they don't need to eat that many. It's just it's just ridiculous. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not doing them good. The calcium requirement, to get the calcium requirement that they need, those things, so if you're feeding them that many crickets or roaches, you're going to have to be putting that much calcium dust on them to equal out the calcium phosphorus ratio. So you have to be, you know, imagine if you fed them 40 crickets and the cricket is anywhere between 1 to 7 to 1 to 10 calcium phosphorus ratio, but you've got to try and flick that the other way, you're going to have to put volumes of crickets in just calcium. In the weight of calcium, even that out to get them to grow properly without any issues, bone issues. So, how do juvenile beardies hunt in the wild? Are they cruising around or are they just sitting waiting no. to see a bug? No. So, they're usually sitting. Um, so, the, where we find them, we find them in bushes. They hold onto the branches in the bushes and, you know, they're deep within the bushes. They're getting scattered light coming into them. Um, usually they're, you know, so they're, they're hidden from predators. Um, and by the time they're born, it's like usually around Christmas time is when their first ones are coming out. And that's quite hot. So they're sitting in a tree, you know, the temperatures are around 35, 40 degrees. So they're getting plenty of heat. Um, and then when an insect runs by, they jump out of the tree, grab it, and then climb back up that tree, well, a bush. It's you know it's a two foot high bush, Three to um, them. <laughs> and that's and that's that's what they're that's how they're they're surviving out there. They they really like to hide in um you know branches and stuff that, that they're well designed for um you know breaking up their patterns. So that's how they they like to live. And then they just jump onto an object or you know if there's any fresh greens coming up, a uh, little herbage, they'll take bites of that as well. So on the flip side, then, how often and how much should we be feeding our adult bearded dragons? So um, adult bearded dragons, 
air feeding. So once again, if you can, if you have quite large, like a bearded dragon, a ma- large male bearded dragon, his head's pretty big. So, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, I still go on, you know, so for example, if I'm feeding a bearded dragon, I tell my clients five, I don't know how to, a large roach. I, I understand Australian woody roaches are quite small compared to some of these American type roaches. I think these American type roaches, you wouldn't want to feed more than three to four twice a week. And then, um, you know, then you'd have about a volume of greens about the size of the bearded dragon's head, um, three times a week. So, and then obviously increase or decrease based on their body condition. So would you flip that based on how would you change that based on the female being gravid? Would you just increase the portion size? Um, I would I'd add in an extra um, protein size on it. Um, and I would be very careful with um, adding too much protein without the required calcium. Because a reproductive female, so from our blood tests, there is an increase in calcium in the blood, a four to seven fold increase in the amount of calcium she needs during that time. So that's a lot more calcium. Um, and they use up, they, any animal that lays eggs, it uses a lot of their bone reserves. Um, so ensuring there's enough calcium will allow them to not develop, um, any fractures or utilize it uh, to overtax their bones um but yeah especially calcium dusting and increasing the protein there as well so because the proteins required for the albumin and then the calcium on the egg but also if you're breeding as a responsible breeder that calcium 30 percent of the calcium is from the shell is used by that hatchling as the form of skeleton. So if you have a female that is not getting enough calcium um, and not laying down enough calcium on that shell, those hatchlings are already predisposed to metabolic bone disease and calcium deficiency straight out of the egg. That's if they make it out of the egg if there's not enough calcium or vitamin D. So just to, just to flip this a little bit to the side, why do we see so many gastric tumours in bearded dragons? So uh, the neuroendocrine tumours that we're seeing in bearded dragons, it isn't... So uh, it has been theorised that it's somewhat genetic due to the small gene pool. But having said that, the increase in detection and increasing numbers, it's also increasing in Australia from my time there. And it's what I have my own theory on it. Um, we're seeing, you know, this craze to feed bearded dragons so frequently is something that's just happened in the last five to ten years. Prior to this, it wasn't really a pro- well in Australia. It wasn't really a problem. We didn't generally get these obese animals. In, we know in humans, increases in the type 1 um, neuroendocrine gastric tumours, so it is increases um, when there's uh, an excess of gastric acid. These animals that we're feeding constantly have got constant gastric acid secretion in their stomachs. And they're just not designed to have a stomach full of food and gastric acid all the time. That's irritating the intestinal, uh, the gastric lining. So these gastric cells, they have to keep dividing and keep multiplying that deal with this increase of gastric acid. Every time a cell divides, it increases the chance of a tumor just because it's got to replicate all the DNA. So we're feeding these animals so much more. They're getting exposed to increased gastric acid all the time. So these 
stomach cells have to keep dividing and that increases the chance of the tumour. And this is why I think we're seeing an increase in these gastric neuroendocrine tumours um, because the, gas, the, the gastric cells are just exposed to so much acid and have to keep multiplying and multiply so much that that's what a tumour is, an uncontrolled growth of a cell, which these neuroendocrine tumours are. But, you know, it's something that, you know, it has, it's getting a lot more attention in the veterinary field. So hopefully we can get to the bottom of it and find out why this is happening. So based on all of this, you're saying like how much you feed them and all these gastric tumours and feeding them less. What are your thoughts on the bowls of meal ones people leave in for like Beard the Dragons constantly? Yeah. Ad -lib. No, I like my McDonald's too. Um, it's just pretty much McDonald's for them. Um, unlimited McDonald's, um, mealworms are just, just high in fat, high in phosphorus. Um, you know, just not the best. Um, you know, it's good to have variety. Um, just like us. Um, but you know, a mealworm, you know, a couple of mealworms every month is fine, but you know, you get a lot of you hear a lot of stories of people's dragons not wanting to eat anything else um it's because one they don't need to eat once they're overweight and two when you're feeding them mcdonald's if you give them healthy food they're just going to go well no i don't want to eat something bland i want to eat something and that's you know that's a natural thing humans dogs everything you give them something high in fat value because fat helps them survive through hard times so yeah, it's not not something you want you want to do. Um, yeah, you don't. But at the same time, you don't want to feed them heaps of just crickets or heaps of just roaches. You just want to give a variety, cover all your uh, amino acids, minerals, and everything like that. Should we be feeding fruit? No. 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 Um, so there was a study out on dental disease and the. Increase in dental disease was due to feeding fruit. That was one of the factors that highly influenced it. Um, but also they, they don't eat fruit out in the wild. We don't, what they're eating is mainly green veggies, um, herbage and, and insects. Um, you know, arid Australia doesn't have any of these like sweet fruits. People aren't feeding them. They're not, there's no strawberries growing out there. There's like, you know, it's just not stuff with that sugar content isn't out there. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just not something that's natural for them. And in the veterinary literature has been shown to pre, uh, predispose them to, um, dental disease. And then also there is somewhat, um, you know, if you look at a lot of, uh, fungal cultures, uh, as well, it increases the fungal culture um, of the gut. So, um, you know, it's, is it going to get to an area where it's bad for them, the fungus levels? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, this is something that I work with every day at the moment. Um, and it, in an animal production world, yeah, it reduces feed efficiency. There's increased number of fungus in the gut, but, you know, nothing that we're concerned about with a pet animal. So. Right, right. So stop feeding fruit. Um, so what are your thoughts then on needing this such a, a amount of calcium when they're growing and if people are feeding lots or if they've got a gravid female who has a really high need of calcium, what are your thoughts on giving like just pure CA in a bowl, like ad lib style for them to self-regulate from? One, whether they're going to self-regulate until... They get to the point where they're so deficient that they start performing pica and want to eat the substrate slash the calcium. Um, but you know, when we, we as humans tend to have a look at these things as an individual thing, calcium, phosphorus. But what about the amino acids and the proteins and all that stuff that all need to come together as a whole? That, that's where we need to look at it. You know, we always look at things like, you know, You've got people saying, oh, don't feed spinach, don't feed um, kale, 
you know, it's this single uh, thing that's evil. But realistically, you know, you need to consider everything as a whole and how it interacts with each other. So I think, you know, solving the problem by just giving them just this is not a problem. Just giving them calcium is not going to solve the fact they don't get UV or this. Everything, the human body, the animal's body is all a network of interconnected things and we just need to balance it really and do it as it would. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to solve our problem, you know, having it there or even, you know, giving them oral doses of calcium or the, um, calcium liquid or anything like that. That's not the way to solve the problem. It's to think of it as a balance and give them everything um, as a balance, increased as a balance. So what supplements should people use? Because what I do is I, I take like a pure CA and I'll take like the Earth Pro A from Arcadia. It's got like everything in it is over like a, a preform to something else or like... Um, like carotenoids to vitamin A, yep. or it's like water soluble, and I yep. basically feed that every single time. I I feed like uh protein, and then I'll do like a multivitamin like once a week, like the synthetic like like a bit yep. more potent ones once a week. So, what do you think of that routine? Generally, I say just because of the variety of um protein insects that we have, none of them are really what we would call suitable and despite i'm guilty of this myself even though me preaching oh yeah you should feed 80 percent veggies that never happens that way so every time i feed a protein source an insect i will dust it with calcium um because you know it doesn't like i think the only one really that is insect that's really good there's certain spiders that are good for um, and certain flies that are good for calcium phosphorus ratio, but, um, your soldier fly larvae, um, black soldier fly larvae are, are good calcium phosphorus ratio. But even then it's their exoskeleton that holds most of the calcium and that's indigestible. The bearded dragon. So are they getting that calcium? So, um, I say dust every insect every time you feed it. Um, I don't worry with calcium. Um, and then I give, uh, multivitamin, um, you know, when a bearded dragon, adult bearded dragon's eating three times a week, I say, uh, every two weeks, feed it a multivitamin with vitamin D in it. I'm not quite sure, you know, you know, if you've got proper UV, it's not really useful, but just to have it there, it's not going to hurt it. You're not going to overdose it. Um, and yeah, so multivitamin every two weeks, um, calcium every protein feed. That's what my recommendation is. Um, is it based off, you know, hard and fast nutrition and science? Um, the calcium for the insects is the multivitamin. We know that, you know, if you're feeding a varied diet, you're going to get most of the vitamins there. And we're just looking at those ones that might be deficient just to make sure that it's in there. But, you know, one thing that I did take from my nutrition lectures at, um, university is that uh a lot of the stuff that is developed um is a, is almost going too far um, in terms of what the vitamins is if you have a balanced diet you don't really need it that much and it's just to pick up anything that just might not be out and you know water-based um vitamins no risk of overdosing but you know you've got your fat fat-based ones there is a risk of build up and you know, we don't want to overdo it so. so we're using it like sparingly just as like a safety net to come back in on underneath to like just if anything's missing to just yeah, that to up. catch anything that's yeah missing yeah but there is um you know not so much in bearded dragons but um in tortoises um there are cases of you know problems if you overdose with certain vitamins they're very prone to overdosing some tortoises and um from um you know, what you see with chameleons, them as well, if you overdose with them, they'll have problems as well. So, I mean, I think I know what your answer is going to be anyway, but what are your thoughts on the commercial diets for bearded dragons that have come out? So, 
there are benefits in that a commercial diet can add the calcium phosphorus ratio, all the vitamins and everything in a proper balance. And that's good. So it doesn't matter whether you're feeding them. Um, if you kept them purely on it, if you're feeding them a lot of it or a little of it, it's going to be balanced when it goes in. But the downfall is who knows what balanced is. There is, I looked at it. I was actually two years ago, three years ago, I went through every commercial diet and started listing the amount of pr uh, protein in it, fat, sugar, all the vitamins. And the amount of protein varied from like 13% to 45%. It was just like, who's developing these? Like, you know, um, developing proper nutrition is hard. It's very hard. Um, when they were doing dogs back in the 80s and stuff like that, they did it and they got it wrong and they found out. And it's taken this long to get a commercial diet for dogs. And most of them are good, um, you know, a good quality, but you know, no one's putting money into bearded dragons. It's not you know, yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah. And it's, it's hard. Animal nutrition is hard. You increase one thing and it interacts with something else and you get a drop in that or, you know, there's got, going to be problems and, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. So I can't, there is no diet I can recommend. Um, but there are benefits if you could get there something good at the end, just because everything will be balanced and you don't have the risk of, of metabolic bone disease, calcium phosphorus ratio things and stuff like that. So, but for now, um, I think we go off what we know works, um, with the live food and stuff like that. And the greens and know what something what they have in the wild, even though you know that bok choy you're getting from the Chinese supermarket represents nothing that you know it's nothing like the the, the low nutrition herbage out there, you know. So yeah, but it's if if we can, you know, the main factors, the main problems are the calcium phosphorus ratio and that the excess excess proteins. That's it, really. What are your thoughts on like weed picking? Because we, my, our tactic is we use like apps like the tortoise table to see if it's green for tortoises. Is normally or along those baselines is probably all right for beard dragons. So we'll pick like dandelions and things. Then we'll use apps to make sure that if the tortoise table is like, yeah, this this plant is like a bog standard green staple for a tortoise diet. Normally it's all right for beard dragons. What are your thoughts on that tactic? Yeah, normally it's all it's all right. Like even plants that we that have been documented that bearded dragons eat on the, in the wild in Australia, we know are toxic to things like, um, horses and cattle and stuff like that. Um, you know, so we know they have a tolerance of some toxins. Um, but generally if it's safe for the tortoises, um, you know, one, the gut's a lot more simple, but, um, than it's, than a tortoise, but, you know, generally they're going to, um, it's going to be safe for a bearded dragon in all case. And, you know, going out and picking it, it's not, not going to be a problem. So. Lovely. No. Right. So let's move into obesity and weight. So you obviously weigh bearded dragons in the wild. What do they weigh? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So when we went through, um, you know, in this graph here from what, 161 to 162 animals, um, Average weight, 341 grams. Um, and males, about 372 grams. So, um, you know, they, I, I tell you right now that most of the captive ones coming in are heavier than most ma the average male. Um, and it's, and we're talking some really big males, males, these animals out in the wild, uh, you can see that they're bigger than anything that I've seen in captivity. And these captive animals are coming in heavier than some of them. So they're just fat. So it's just fat. Um, yeah. As I said, wild bearded dragons are super lean. They're like boxers, you know, they're just, um, you know, wiry, um, you know, not really carrying any fat on them. Um, in autumn, 
we did find some very large animals, um, males. As you can see, there's a maximum male. He weighed 553 grams. So if someone told me that their bearded dragon weighed 553 grams, um, I'd say, okay, that's not the fattest one I've seen. That's, yeah, they're, um, a lot of captive ones are, are reaching 600 to 800 grams and they're extremely obese. Um, but you know, they're, they are lean out there and you can see they're not fat. Um, they're, so how we tell a lot of the body condition of them is we feel their, uh, inguinal fat pads. So we feel just inside their, their belly, just in front of their, uh, in front of their back legs. And we feel two, um, objects in there, which are their inguinal fat pads. And, you know, usually they're about, you know, in a healthy dragon out in the wild, they're about the size of my pinky. In a lot of these fat dragons we see in captivity, they're about bigger than my thumb and this part of my hand. That's how big they're in. And they take up most of the abdominal cavity. And because there is no separation between the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity, the chest cavity, it pushes up on their lungs. And some of these animals really struggle to breathe. So, yeah. So, you know, I would say that, you know, yeah, they don't need to be lean as a wild animal, but I wouldn't want them more than 10 to 15% heavier than a wild animal at equivalent. Because once you start getting the weight, you start getting fatty liver disease, females that have um, uncontrolled uh, egg laying and stuff like that. So, hmm. so they're, they're only laying in the wild because of the excess calories? Yep. So if you look at any wild species, um, they need excess calories to reproduce for the females. Um, it's what they do. You look at birds, um, you know, once the food becomes abundant, they start laying eggs um, and they put excess calories towards that. So in the wild, if they've got enough food, they'll lay. If there's no food, then it's self-preservation, just survive until they can breed. So, um, you know, in captivity, they're food all the time, excess food, and it just overrides their females' natural, um, you know, stops to tell them not to breed, they just go in and then they um, ovulate without not being fertile and then have infertile eggs in captivity. So what role does obesity have on basking in behaviour in captivity? So a big problem is obese dragons. So reptiles in general, they'll when they have excess stores, they store it within the body cavity. Why? Because fat's an insulator. In an endothermic animal like us, we store it under our skin, on our bellies and stuff like that. Um, and then it also, it keeps us warm. We tend to get hot because we're trying to, keep, we're keeping the heat in. In a reptile, they're trying to let the heat in and extremely obese reptiles, once they fill up their internal, um, in, in the coelom, in their body cavity stores, it starts laying it under their skin. And that actually insulates, um, you know, it stops the amount of heat getting into their body um, and it makes them harder to thermoregulate. We commonly see it, you know, oh, I've had my basking spot at 38 degrees. Yep, it's one and a half degrees higher than the preferred optimal body temperature. But they had it at that temperature since it was a hatchling. Then it got to 300 grams and it's like, okay, doing all right but once it becomes five six hundred grams heat that mass that's more than a hundred percent extra mass than a normal one and you're still using that marginal heat available so a lot of these big dragons are coming in with um you know secondary bacterial infections problems related and they go oh yeah we have it at 38 degrees and then as soon as they come in, I tell them to crank it up to 42 degrees. The dragon starts basking. It gets better. Um, obviously, it gets hungrier because it's warmer. But we try to get them to lose weight. But it's very common for these fat dragons to get secondary, um, you know, conditions 
due to not being able to get warm enough. And also the fact that their livers, they've got fatty liver disease, their liver is responsible um, for the immune system as well, producing um, the immunoglobulins. So a bad liver means they have a poor immune system as well. So that contributes to it. Oh, and what I've got now is I've got pictures of all three of our dragons. So we're talking about body condition all, all this entire episode. So I thought it'd be good if we can get you to judge the body condition of our animals. Then we're not yes. taking some random person's fat dragon off the internet. We're using our animals, and that can be the baselines for people watching. So let me start prepping an image to show you. I think we'll start with my adult female. Um, so let me share this screen one second. So right. when we talk about body condition, we usually use a scale. So a scale when we do it is between is it's either usually out of five or out of nine. And you always use an odd number because there's a number smack bang in the middle, which is perfect score. So um which scale <laughs> would you do you well when you think about body condition score, what would be something that's easiest? Out of nine or out of five? five for a veterinarian, probably. out of nine is probably easier for us because it has little, you know, those little in betweens. But for the general public, I think out of five would be. I would probably say out of five because that's yeah. what you get taught at like college level and things of like that as well. So. Okay, so out of five. I would say that this dragon here is about oh, upside down. Um, I would say it's almost smack bang on perfect. So, wow, um, and we're done. <laughs> so this is um, similar to uh, what we see in, uh, you know, an average male that is out in the wild um, is at the back of his head, um, the fat pads, they're not too large. Um, it can be a bit deceiving in males, especially at breeding season. They develop these massive, because they're, they're biting muscles. So they develop these large muscles there. Um, but you look at the tail, um, it's thick. It's not emaciated. Um, you don't see, um, this kind of like in really fat dragons, they get the fat and then it goes dips back down where the, um, Spine is in the tail. So. Right, I'll take that. I'm happy that she's not on either end. It'd be easy to fix to give her more food than to get her to lose more weight, I suppose. So, tail is nice and round. Head muscles good. What species is this guy? It is. It is vidsteps. Yeah, is it a morph? Leatherback? Yeah, he's a uh, leatherback. Yeah, okay. Um, now the question is, has he been fed just prior to this photo? If he hasn't, I would say he's probably a three to three and a half because his stomach looks quite bulgy. No, yeah, he's full of food. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'd take it probably just down to, uh, it's, it's just above perfect. So, you know, instead this of, is you know. This About is three. the male that I was saying he is just coming up to a year old now and, yep. he's and sits he's still small on the palm of my hand. So yep. yeah, he's a tiny boy. Right, there we go. Let's share this. There we go. That's the female. Yeah, she's good. Perfect. Tail's good. Back of the head's good. Do you have any like I, do you have any on the like I'm showing their belly as well? I've only it's, got it's, top downs yeah. to show like like angle of the bowl yes. and stuff. Um a day so on the side. Something I mean, that I would consider other than just looking down on them is actually palpating the inguinal fat pads, which is it gives me a lot better in in the clinic, it gives me a lot better idea of um condition and what I can say is, you know, perfect or maybe lose a little bit. Interesting. So, are they a lot leaner than what most um, clients, dragons that you would see in yes. practice? Yes, a hundred percent. They, 
would be in the less than 10% of animals that come in. So that, oh, perfect. So, um, even if you look at them, um, I would say that they're, they're probably a bit more, a bit more conditioned than what we could, I saw in the wild ones during the time that I was, um, doing my trial, um, which isn't a bad thing. It just means that, you know, if something bad does happen, you're not dealing with an emaciated dragon if they got sick or something like that. So, so, um, no, it's, they were very good condition. Yeah. Happy with that. Cause it was intentional to keep them leaner as well. So I'm happy that we've got a spot on so far. It's, it's, it's difficult because like I've done like adults and you can look at your videos and you can see you find adults and you go, like, okay, I can look at that and that and try and get to that. But that transitionary phase of like baby to adult, that's very hard to gauge for me. And I don't think I've got there yet, but thank thank you. I think that's going to be really helpful for people that are like got a transitional stage animal as well. Yeah. So that's perfect. So let's move on to some more general health questions then. What's the average lifespan of a bearded dragon in the wild? Okay, cool. So what are your thoughts on like harnessing bearded dragons? Because some people say it's fine and some people say when you like take them for a walk sort of thing. Some people say it can damage their chest. What's the truth of that? So harnesses generally like the the region that a harness is on is a very robust region. They have a um you know, a thoracic girdle, which is quite strong. It's probably the other than the skull is probably the strongest part of a bearded dragon. Harnessing them. A lot of the time, the, the things that we're doing to these animals, we think they like to sit on our shoulder, take them out. We're adding stress to them. We really have to think about, you know, what you're doing to your animal. You got on a harness and you're taking it out. Is it able to thermoregulate? There was a study done on about handling bearded dragons, and they found that, you know, handling them actually stressed them out, despite them sitting there cool and calm. There are species that freezes when they're stressed. And so you've got to be, we can't determine whether they're freezing because they're stressed or they're freezing because they like it, you know, when I say freezing, like sitting on you. Um, so, you know, taking them out on a harness, um, Maybe it's been, you know, it's one of those dragons that stresses out if things change because it hasn't been had enough stimulation, whether it's, it's really good for them. So, um, I'm not one to go, you know what, take your dragon out for harness walks. And, and the main reason is, is, you know, thermoregulation stress, the risk of having, bringing on something else, subclinical disease or, maybe putting them into subclinical. Um, that's, that's more where it comes from. They're not, they're not like these endothermic dogs that can go on a lead and walk with you everywhere. Um, you know, it, they're not going to really benefit from that. What they want to do is they just want to sit in their territory, thermoregulate, breed, um, dig, um, not sit in, in a harness, um, becoming a pseudo dog. What are your thoughts on like breeding for good body? Uh, blah, 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 blah. What are your thoughts on breeding for like good body proportions? Because I see some people have like bearded dragons and it's like they're so squashed in their face because of how inbred they are. And there's breeders in the US like fairy tale dragons who like it's very strictly breeding for like, good body proportions. And if an animal comes out that isn't looking right, it just gets excluded from the project. Do you think we should be going that direction? Yeah. So, you know, we're getting to the point where people are breeding for traits. So these squashed faces, um, some of it has been shown to be related to metabolic bone disease, incorrect calcium phosphorus ratio. Um, you know, the jaw has the most calcium of the whole body of the dragon, like the skull. So a lot of these animals are not getting the correct calcium phosphorus ratio growing too fast, they're feeding them too much. Um, and that's where the problem is. We Typically we see, um, you know, we see it in blue tongue skinks as well. If they're fed a lot of dog food and stuff like that, where they grow rapidly and the calcium is not there. Um, we get a brachycephalic, so a short face, that squished face. Um, so that is one, you know, that address the nutrition of them, uh, but also it could be related to genetics. And, 
there is some genetic component in the way well it's in the way a dragon looks is highly genetic um so breeding for good proportions they're shaped for a reason if we start breeding them for other things then we start getting problems breathing problems um increased arthritis and then we go down the path of like you know you bulldogs and stuff like that so it is good to have a functional dragon it's it has evolved to be that shape for a reason as soon as we have a deleterious effect sometimes not um but you know it's we we at the end of the day when we're doing anything we've got to look at the welfare of the animal that's the most important thing and if it's going down the path of pain or not being able to function as normal then we've gone too far well said well said and i think the one thing we haven't covered at all is adenovirus what are your thoughts on adenovirus so um a preliminary part of my study was um taking swabs and testing wild bearded dragons for adenovirus and so of the 27 animals that we sampled 29% of them a third of them had adenovirus we were doing bloods on them and all the bloods were all perfectly normal then the adenovirus that they were carrying was typed and they looked back at it um you know the guy that did it he's a, um you know knows all that stuff but he traced it back that these animals the adenovirus that they had was closely related to the gila monster adenovirus wow and that virus has been in them and evolving with the bearded dragon since their split with the gila monster so they're the natural host of adenovirus so wild animals naturally have adenovirus and they've had it for millennia and it's been evolving with them they're the natural host but why is it causing such a problem if they're the natural host and we've got to look at it from clinically i've had problems owners animals always sick tested it had adenovirus and then we corrected their husbandry they never had a problem again they're carrying this virus and it only gets out of control when they're, Im they're immunosuppressed the husbandry's not correct yet yeah, sure you've got your weak individuals that are going to succumb to it early on but if we look at you know when these animals are succumbing juveniles are quite predisposed to having problems with adenovirus and this is a typical age for when animals are stressed it's like young kids always sick young any young animal is when it's going to get stressed and sick and it's just what they're carrying and you know the way bearded dragons are bred stick them all in a bucket you know they're all competing for food they've got to stack up on top of each other for heat so they're super stressed most of them um start shedding coccidia then there's a high coccidia load so they've all got that so there's extra stress there and then they move off to their new home to a new keeper who doesn't know how to keep bearded dragons and wants to hold them all day that's extra stress and then they fold then they rock up to the vet and the vet go then they want to get tested before a dinovirus of course it's going to have a dinovirus it's had it but is that the main problem it hasn't been the main problem it's had so many stresses on its on it in that early stage on top of it being a young juvenile that um is what predisposes it to come down and you know have problems secondary to that um at the big eye care conference um it was last year or the year before um they had mark mitchell a us vet and rachel marshane who's in germany and she does a lot of testing on adenovirus mark mitchell he is in the us and they were going to do a study on adenovirus in captive dragons and they went to a large commercial um facility and 80% of the dragons that were being supplied to the pet shops in the US had adenovirus 
because of the way they keep them. They keep them all close and confined. Uh, and then, then Rachel Marshing in Germany said in Europe they tested it and it was a lot lower. But it was just the way because people buy bearded dragons from other breeders and not from commercial pet shops where they produce in thousands. So, you know, in some ways, you know, they've always had it. We're only detecting it more because we've got the technology to do it a lot cheaper and easier. And vets know about it now. But prior to this, just as many bat bearded dragons probably had the dinner virus. And from my clinical experience, they don't come in and they're not just sick from a dinner virus. They're sick because the husbandry is poor and that's allowed the adenovirus to take a hold and cause more problems and comorbidities, coccidia, overgrowth of pinworms, flagellates, stuff like that. Does adenovirus have any benefit to be the dragons like pinworm might do, or is it completely just a negative on them? Nothing that I can think of. I think they're just like any other virus, just taking advantage, trying to survive. Um, you know, that's that's it really. And you know, I guess the wild dragons have the benefit in that the stronger they are and they breed and they breed strong offspring, captivity-wise, someone wants to breed their in, already inbred leatherback slash um, silkback that already has a poor immune system or um, they're breeding closely related siblings or zeros and stuff like that, so their immune systems are already poor. So a smaller amount of poor husbandry is just going to cause that animal to um, fold quite quickly. So do you think people who have, they know it's test positive for adenovirus, do you think they should just not breed? Is that a responsible thing to do? Or is it everything's got it now? So it's... Um, I would say it's it's more just... I would have no problem... Me personally, if my kid wanted a bearded dragon, I would buy it from someone, whether it had a dinner virus or not, because I know I would get the husbandry right, which is the main thing that's going to cause the problem. It's a good marketing ploy to go, you know what, I've got their dinner virus free. Then possibly you could allow the immune system to be, you could allow the husbandry to be a bit poorer if they didn't have a dinner virus, weren't carriers. That's it, really. But I have. No problem. Um, you know, a study in Australia, the guy that does the tests in Australia, 50% of the animals and 50% of the collections that he tested were positive for adenovirus. It's like cold sores in humans. You know, it's a very good analogy. A large yeah. population have it. It's not until you get stressed that it becomes a problem. So, you know, if it is good to try and breed these virus free things, but you know, everything would almost have a virus. You just got to be able to detect it. <laughs> you know, someone to be able to detect it. So, very well said. Well, I think we've hit <laughs> we've hit four hours, and I'm incredibly grateful that you've had the patience to really let us extract this much information out of you. Um, the last thing before we let you go is we got a question from the last guest, and that was from Tom Griffiths. Yep. He's got two. One of them you don't have to answer. I don't think one of them is serious. He says, why did you knock his door at 3 a.m.? And the second question <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is, why do bearded dragons have five fingers or toes and not like four? So if we look at, you have to go back to when, uh, you know, for all those uh, evolution fans, uh, when the first the vertebrates came out of the oceans, they had four legs and they had five fingers so that's it really so fair enough the, that that's it so <laughs> um, you know we, we've got what well, you look at horses horses you know they evolved and they're literally running on one finger so that's why they've only got that what you would think is one toe but the truth is is they just evolved to have that one finger so yeah um last thing one question from you could be anything about anything for the next guest don't know who the next guest is it's a generic question they're just gonna have to ask answer oh, 
Jeez. Okay. Um, so, should governments be legislating um, our enclosure sizes and um, husbandry practices, or should we as the hobby be governing the husbandry practices and cage sizes? All right, okay, I'll pose that to the next guest. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been a long time that we've kept you on here for. The question list is very, very long, so we're incredibly grateful that you've given us the time of day to really get this much information out of you. So thank you so much for coming on. Yep, no problem. My pleasure. For anyone that wants you as a wants to be your client, where can they reach out to find you if they're in the vicinity so, of you? So I've actually um I'm actually not working in clinic anymore. I'm work, working in research, so I don't actually do clinic based stuff anymore. Um, but if you go to my follow and my bitty bitty vet uh, on Instagram or on Facebook, um. I can generally answer very generic questions, specific questions, health questions are difficult for cases because um, technically I've got to be able to examine your animal. So, you know, I can offer generic advice, but it's not definitive. Um, and also just give it time because I do get a lot of messages each day and I've just got to work through it. Yeah. So it's, it's great that you commit to answering though. I like that a lot. No problems. Okay. Right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Thank Jonathan. You. Bye. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This is an amazing episode. I am so proud that we got to have you on. Me and Ellie are hardcore into Beer the Dragons. We've got three of them now. We absolutely loved this episode and I loved pouring over it a second time to even edit it. It's just one of my favourite videos on the internet now. So I am immensely proud of this episode. I am so grateful that you had the patience to sit there for four hours while I absolutely interrogated you. So thank you so much. Anyone watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. What we're going to do is I'm going to pull loads of extracts out of this as individual videos so that people searching for like, oh, should I bathe the beard of the dragon or should beard of the dragons eat fruit? There's going to be loads of extracts going out as individual videos as this like wide casting net for like search queries to helpfully hope people help people getting into beard of the dragons and to help those beginners get the words from the man beard of it himself rather than watching some like really shitty pet tubey videos. Let's get, let's disseminate beard of it to the masses and that's what I am really motivated and determined to do because it's needed give everyone access to this and get eyeballs to this so you might see like a lot of things coming out of this episode on the channel in the next few months but trust me Beer the Dragons need it to happen so we're going to do it but thank you very much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode